chapter four. Uh, this chapter is about fair housing. We have a new requirement for CE that you need to complete one hour of fair housing classes uh, for your continuing education when you renew your licenses too. So this chapter is all gonna be about fair housing, all the anti-discrimination laws that are out there, the types of discrimination. And look, we, we can't possibly go over all the types of discrimination. There's more discrimination out there than you would even believe, you know? Um, Discrimination, when we talk about discrimination in this chapter, discrimination is more than a black and white thing. You know, uh, you got, you got, hell, you got black people that discriminate against black people, Hispanics that his discriminate against Hispanics, all, all kinds of stuff like that. You know, uh, religion, race, color, sexual orientation, preferences, familial status, there's uh, your, your, uh, your medical uh, disability. Uh, there's all kinds of protected classes that we're going to go over when it comes to discrimination. Uh, so we're, we're going to go over the protected classes rather than the different types of discrimination that people can get involved in. We're going to get involved in just knowing the, the basic guidelines that you got to follow. Uh, which will then get you in line and prepared for that. Uh, what do you do if you got a client that wants to discriminate, all that stuff, uh, we're going to go over in this. We're going to be learning about the laws, the federal laws and the New Jersey laws against discrimination in this chapter. Um, and this stuff is going to be on exam. You know, they want to make sure that you're not breaking laws, right? So most of your exam on your state anyway is going to be about a lot of this stuff that's coming out of these first couple of chapters. So by the end of this chapter, you can be able to identify protections of the federal fair housing laws, including enforcement, who enforces it, describe the protections of the New Jersey LAD, the law against discrimination, including state regulations and on rentals. We're gonna discuss the implications of fair housing laws for brokers and salespersons as well. Now, equal opportunity in housing. Both federal and state local laws uh, are about human rights and fair housing affect rental sales at every phase of the real estate sales process from the listing to the closing. Why? Well, we want to make sure everybody has an equal opportunity for fair housing and having a place to live. Everybody needs a place to live. So we have these laws out there to, to protect everybody so that everybody has equal rights and the, the ability to have an own property or lease and all that stuff without being discriminated against. So failure to comply with fair housing practice is not only grounds for loss of your license, but it's also an unlawful act. Now, Here's a little notation that I added in here. When two laws cover the same topic, the more restrictive rule will always prevail. Okay. And that goes for everything. That goes everything from discrimination laws, because we have state and federal laws. If one law is more restrictive than the other, which one do you follow? The one that has more restrictions to it. Okay. Um, look, it, it, it'll, it could deal with zoning laws too. Um, Hmm. Hold on one second. I got to open up my whiteboard here. I never opened it up this morning. So um, it could deal with zoning laws. Let me ask you guys a question. When, um, when the city has a minimum, uh, when the city has a minimum zoning requirement to build a house on a lot of 50 by a hundred foot and a developer has a minimum requirement of a hundred by a hundred foot lot, which one's more restrictive? The zoning on the you say that one more time? If the city has a minimum uh, zoning requirement to build a house on a lot of 50 by 100 lot and the uh, developer uh, puts in the deed of zoning restriction of 100 by 100, which one's more restrictive? The city. Mm. Why'd you say that? Because it's smaller? It's actually the developer. Because really? look, if you have a 100 foot by 100 foot lot, how many houses can you put on it? Only one. But if you went right. by the city's zoning requirement, you could put two houses on that lot. It's 50 by 100. Uh, it's the minimum uh, requirement. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So a lot of people, a lot of people select that mistakenly because they're like, oh, it's the smaller 
of the two. Yeah, but the smaller requirement would allow you to put more houses there. So it's actually less restrictive, you know, uh, okay. by having that minimum zoning requirement uh, of the lot sizes. Wait for this whiteboard to open up. Hold on. Let me close it and open it again. Give it a little kickstart. Come on, Microsoft. Open it. One of these days, she will open. All right. Anyway, I don't need that right now. So let's go back to the slideshow. All right, so equal opportunity in housing. We're gonna to turn to the next page, 64. Why do we have fair housing laws once again? So that everybody has equal rights to have a place to live, own or rent and to be able to own personal property. Violating these laws is a criminal act. So I, by the way, guys, my slides here are great to study from rather than the chopped up highlighting we're gonna be doing throughout the uh, chapter here. Like this, for example. I got the breakdown of everything you need to know about the Civil Rights Act of 1866 here. The Civil Rights Act of 1866 was part of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. It grants equal rights to all citizens for ownership of real and personal property. That's basically all property. There's only two kinds of property in this world. Real property, which defines real estate, is defined as real estate, and personal property, like the clothes on your back, right? So in 1866, what significant thing happened there when it comes to race back then? A little history lesson for us here. When, who was president back in 1866? Lincoln. 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 Emancipation Proclamation. There we go. So uh, this, this, is, this is a good way to remember what is the protected class for the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It is race. Because what happened back in the 1800s there? Lincoln freed the slaves, right? And that had to deal mainly with race, right? So when it comes to race, there's no exceptions allowed to this federal law. All right, so this is a way to try to remember because we're gonna get questions. You may have to know what law covers what protected class. So back in the 1800s, that's when, um, that's w the significant act with President Lincoln freed the slaves and then you could think race, right? So there, it covers all types of property are covered by this law, all real estate. Uh, real estate and personal property. Um, that includes unimproved land, uh, personal properties like the clothes on your back and your personal belongings. The protected classes are race and color. But later on in 1987, 87, the 1866, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 added two additional classes, ethnicity and religious groups as well. It's enforced by HUD. Who enforces the Civil Rights Act of 1866? Well, when it comes, pertains to real estate anyway, HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development. People have one year to file a complaint to be heard by uh, in front of an administrative judge within HUD. HUD has its own <laughs> judges. That all they do is listen to discrimination cases. All right, so you could either wait to have it heard in federal court, and then you have, if you're gonna, uh, if you want your court, your case heard in federal court, you have two years to uh, to file the complaint. Okay, so I try to I try to word this here that uh, who enforces it? HUD. You have how long do you have to file a complaint? One year, unless you want to make a federal case out of it, and then you got two. Okay, so I, I make a statement like that because when you make statements like that people often remember them a little bit better, you know? Uh, how long do you got to file a complaint? One year, unless you want to make a federal case out of it, and then you got two, right? Um, and if it's heard in federal court, there's no monetary caps on the penalties or 
awards uh, for settlements there. But if you if it's heard in front of an administrative judge within HUD, there are monetary caps and there. We don't have to memorize what those fines are for first, second or third offense for the federal law because they're obscure numbers. So you'll see what I mean when we when we get to it here. But basically, I just gave you the rundown of everything here under the Civil Rights Act of 1866. But we're going to go into it in a little more detail and we're going to do some highlighting now. So under the Civil Rights Act of 1866 on page 64, on the second line, we're just going to highlight Civil Rights Act of 1866. Just highlight those words. And then the line right below it to the right, we're going to highlight race and color. Then two lines directly below that, we're going to highlight real and personal property. That's the type of property that's covered under this law. And then in the next paragraph, on the second line, we're going to highlight ethnic and religious groups. Those are the two additional protected classes that they add. And below that, we're going to highlight no exceptions are allowed to this federal law. Because you're going to see there are some anti-discriminatory laws that have exceptions to them. Because laws have exceptions to them, that, that's not a green light to go discriminate against somebody. You'll see why there's uh, exceptions carved out. Look, why do we have more than one law that covers the same topic of discrimination? Different laws are created for different reasons. And uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1866 deals with all kinds of property. And when it comes to race, you can never discriminate, okay? Now, we're gonna have uh, other federal laws and state laws that have a lot more protected classes than four. Uh, the federal law only has race, color, ethnicity, and religious groups under the Civil Rights Act of 1866 as protected classes. Um, we're gonna go over the next law that's gonna have more protected classes. But before we do, let's examine, um, oh no, we're gonna get right into it right now. Okay, so we're gonna get into the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. Let's stop right there, don't even read it. Look at the title here. What kind of property does this cover? What kind of property does this law cover? The Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. Residential. Boom. That's a no-brainer right there, right? It says it in the title, right? Fair Housing Act of 1968. Now, it's a little complicated the way they word it in the book. Well, we're going to highlight it anyway. Let's highlight the Fair Housing Act of 1968 is contained in Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968. And then below that, we're gonna highlight race, color, religion, and national origin. And then at the end of the line, highlight residential property, because that's the type of property that it covers. So basically, there was another Civil Rights Act in 1968. And within a Civil Rights Act that covered all kinds of discrimination issues, there was a section in there, Title VIII, which is known as the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968, which covers ownership of real property for residential use. So what's the purpose of this whole law? For residential property. So um, Title VIII, I, I tried to break this down on this slide so it's more understandable. The Civil Rights Act of 1968 has a section dedicated to fair housing called Title VIII, which is also known as the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. This law does have some exceptions to it, except for race. When it comes to race, remember that it, you, we fall back on the more restrictive law. The more restrictive rule always prevails. And the 1866 law, there are no exceptions to the law when it comes to race, right? So see two laws, this Federal Fair Housing Act, we're gonna learn has some exceptions to it. 
But because it has exceptions, doesn't mean you could discriminate against somebody. It's not your green light to go discriminate because we fall back on the other laws that are in place that would then cover that, that would pick that up and say you can't discriminate on people based on their race, even though it's race, color, uh, religion. Oh, wait, race, color, national origin, and uh, what was the other one? And ethnicity. All right. So uh, type of property that's covered is residential property, whether it's for sale or lease or transfer. And that also includes vacant land that's to be used for residential property, okay? Um, protected classes are race, color, religion, or national origin. Uh, some later amendments to the law added sex in 1974 as a protected class. And then in 1988, people with disabilities, including those with AIDS and familial status were added uh, to the law. Um, familial status means you have children under the age of 18. It's basically for, for people with kids. You can't discriminate against somebody because they're pregnant or because they have children, okay? Alcoholics and persons in treatment are considered a protected class. So alcoholics and persons like in drug treatment programs are considered a protected class. But current drug abusers and people who pose a threat to the health and safety of others are not. So basically, if you're a drug addict and you're in treatment, you're a protected class. But if you're not in treatment, you're not. Okay. Um, and then there's some other exemptions to the law that we're going to be going over in a moment. So yeah, not, not just yet. So let's see, on this uh, thing, let's go to the book. The Federal Fair Housing Act covers dwellings and apartments, as well as vacant land acquired for construction of residential buildings and prohibits the following discriminatory acts. We're going to go over this in a little more detail here. Refusing to sell, rent, or negotiate with any person or otherwise make a dwelling unavailable to a person as a means of discrimination. Changing the terms condition or conditions or services for different individuals as a means of discriminating. Practicing discrimination through any statement or advertisement that restricts the sale or rental of residential property. Representing to any person as a means of discrimination that a dwelling is uh, not available for sale or rent when it is. That these are all things that are covered under this federal law. Making a profit by inducing owners of housing to sell or rent because of the prospective entry into the neighborhood of persons of a particular race, highlight race, color, religion, national origin, disability, or familial status. And then I want you to write the word blockbusting right after that. Um, where is it? You see, I have the word up here, blockbusting. It's one word, blockbusting. I want you to write that right after that bullet point. That's the one, two, three, four, fifth bullet point down. And then next to the next to the next bullet point, which we didn't read yet, I want you to write steering. Uh, I'm sorry, redlining. I want you to write redlining next to the next bullet point. So redlining is altering the terms or conditions for a home loan to any person who wishes to purchase or repair a dwelling or otherwise make such a loan um, uh, not available. Well, you know what? Redlining does not only deal with loans. It also deals with insurance. It deals with the money. When you think about redlining, think about red ink. You know, when we're talking about money, red ink, uh, what is that indicating? bad it's bad right so you're not getting it or your your finances are in the red right yeah, you're in the so red. so try to think of when you hear redlining try to think of it as discrimination when it comes to stuff that deals with money you know yeah so uh refusing to give financing or a mortgage loan to somebody as a means of discrimination and we're going to go over that i actually even have a video of that do i have it in the slideshow oh i should put it in the slideshow 
maybe I will later, but uh, I'll show you a video for that too. Um, actually, I could, I could throw that video up now. Why not? Let me, let me go pull it up. Video. Fair housing and red lighting. All right, there's a little bit of salty language at the beginning of this one. So uh, hold on to your uh, girdle, Myrtle. All right. <laughs> yeah, it starts off with a line from Chris Rock. So, you know, he's got a Martin Luther King's did for nonviolence. Now it's Martin Luther King, a street. And I don't give a fuck where you live in America. If you're a Martin Luther King Boulevard, there's some violence going on there. It's Chris Rock's famous joke about streets named for Martin Luther King Jr., which tend to be in, let's say, distressed areas. And he's not wrong, because if you look at the way housing segregation works in America, you can see how things ended up this way. Once you see it, you won't be able to unsee it. Okay, let's look at MLK Boulevard in Baltimore. I want to show you how to see housing segregation in schools, in health, in family wealth, in policing. But first, an explanatory comma. It's the 1930s in the wake of the Great Depression, FDR's president, he wants to bring economic relief to millions of Americans through a collection of federal programs and projects called the New Deal. One part of that New Deal was the National Housing Act of 1934, which introduced ideas like the 30-year mortgage and low fixed interest rates. So now you have all these lower income people who can afford homes, but how do you make sure they don't default on their new mortgages? Enter the Homeowners Loan Corporation. The HOLC created residential security maps, and these maps, they're where the term redlining comes from. Green meant best area, best people, aka businessmen. Blue meant good people like white collar families. Yellow meant a declining area with working class families. And red meant detrimental influences, hazardous, like foreign born people, low class whites, and most significantly, Negroes. Again and again on these HOLC maps, one of the most consistent criteria for red line neighborhoods is the presence of black and brown people. Let's be clear, study. Now, uh, one thing, if you guys catch it there, a lot of times people uh, only focus on the color aspect of it. But back then, just as badly were people who were foreign born citizens were discriminated against as well. Um, mainly, I think it was the, um, the Irish and uh, who else was it? Uh, you were really badly discriminated against back then. But uh, they took that, if you look at those, uh, those applications that they're showing here, you see it says foreign born, they got it highlighted here. So on the same line, they got these, th they, they got these two things for the inhabitants. See, that's illegal. You can't, it is illegal now. You cannot consider somebody's race or national origin, where they come from, what country they come from, um, when, uh, when determining whether you're going to give them a loan or not, or if it's a risky loan because, uh, because of their race or where they come from, okay? Back then, they did. Uh, look, look at and read and see how some of this factors in. Look, infiltration of, and they have Negroes here, and then a relief families uh, decreasing. All right, I don't know what all this stuff is about, but there's um, there's a lot of stuff on there that they shouldn't be considering when they're going to be granting somebody a loan. But this is this is a little video that just shows you about redlining. And we already just basically went over the basics of redlining. So I'm going to let it play just a little bit more, but we, I, I just want you to get a visualization of what they meant by redlining maps and what redlining means. So you see how they color coded the neighborhoods based on who lives in them. Okay. Black and brown people. Let's be clear. Studies show that people who lived in redlined areas were not necessarily more likely to default on their mortgages, but redlining made it difficult, if not impossible, to buy or refinance. So landlords abandon their properties, city services become unreliable, in most places crime increases, and property values drop. 
all of these conditions fester for 30 years as white people flee to the brand new suburbs popping up all over the country. Now, the, the, the story always gets a little bit altered depending on who is telling it and how they're telling it, okay? Um, there, there was something also called blockbusting. Um, and the, the announcer here is talking about how white people flee, flee neighborhoods. But there was, um, there was a practice that was called blockbusting that was going on by investors as well as um, uh, investors, as well as a lot of these uh, lenders and such, where they tried to um, uh, make and uh, retain values of properties by, by trying to keep them to be all white areas. Now, in order to do this, what they were doing is trying to incentivize uh, they, they needed to have a place for black people to live. If they were going to be separating them, right? Uh, having white people live in one area, they needed a place for black people to live. So what they, what they were doing was a practice called blockbusting, where they would go knock on a person's door and they would say, hey, listen, did you hear that these people are moving to the neighborhood, whether they're Blacks, Hispanics, or uh, working class people, or foreign born citizens, you know, and they're going to drive down the values of your property. Um, if, you, if you're looking to sell and get out, I'm willing to, I'm willing to buy it from you, but I'm not going to pay the top market value for it because, you know, property values are going to be going down and all, you know, so blockbusting is a practice of playing on somebody's fears of a protected class moving to the area. They basically drum up some kind of a story, try to scare the homeowner into selling their property. And then they usually buy it cheap and then they turn around, they sell it to that very protected class that they're playing on their fears about at a marked up price. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the rest of this story starts getting into, mm, it gets a little bit. It gets a little bit slanted, depending on who's telling the story and how, what kind of uh, picture they're trying to uh, trying to portray. Um, and there is there's truth in it, but there's also some skewing to it as well. So I, I don't want to get into it because we want to stay related to real estate here. Uh, I don't want to get into the, so, the social issues of how they're uh, discussing that. But um, what is redlining? You saw those maps, okay? Yeah. And how he explained it, I thought was right on the money. Uh, so uh, I, I like to show this example here. You guys can even look up some of these historic red line maps. They have them in, um, in archives online that you could download uh, to, to take a look at them for every, every city. You wanna see your city that you live in? They got them for every city archive. I, I have a link to it somewhere in my browser. Um, but now I got this video, so it's a lot easier to show than these uh, uh, high resolution, uh, big filed uh, maps. Okay, so that's what redlining is. Okay, well, we got more videos to show about different topics here. Uh, I don't have one for the blockbusting yet, but I just explained it. Uh, I'm trying to find one from blockbusting that they showed uh, was happening in um, uh, Chicago, Illinois. I think that's where it started. Uh, where the practice, um, oh wait, no, it wasn't, it was, uh, oh geez, where the hell was that? What's that place where Biden's from? That town. Scranton? No, no, yeah, yeah, when he was five years old. No, um, <laughs> no, where, where was he living now? Uh, whatever, the state that he's living now, that, that area, that's, that's where the, uh, Delaware? Practice started. Hmm? Was it Delaware? Yeah, it was somewhere in Delaware. Uh, that, that's where the practice started. And basically, I've seen a great documentary on this from, uh, I just can't find the damn video. I want to show it in class, where basically they show a little historic thing of how blockbusting worked. And uh, they show some of these historic videos where they're showing you that persons knock on the door and they're talking about these people are moving into the neighborhood. And some of these investors, they were real schemers. What they did is they went as far as to pay some black uh, lady uh, to push a stroller uh, while they're talking to the person. So basically they knock on the door and they'd be like, hey, these people are moving into the neighborhood. They're gonna be driving down your property values and they're gonna ruin the neighborhood. 
oh my God, look at that. They're here already, you know, and they have the lady pushing the stroller. In the meantime, somebody that they're paying to do that, you know, and they're trying to scare people. It's, it's like a whole conspiracy here. They're, they're trying to scare people into selling the, the home um, at, at a low price. And then they turn around, they mark it up and then they sell it and they get rich. You know, uh, I, I don't think that those people really cared about anybody's color one way or the other. They were just using it as a tool to get rich, you know. Um, uh, using discrimination and people still do stuff like that. They dis they discriminate now. Um, now the, the 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 racial stuff I really don't see as prevalent in real estate that much. I do come across it sometimes, but it it's not as prevalent as you would think. Um, what I what I find what I find to happen more with discrimination is. Uh, I see people discriminating against their, for lack of a better term, their own kind, you know, I, like I, I've seen Indian people discriminate against Indian people because of the dialect they speak or the region that they're from. Uh, Haitian people discriminating against other Haitians because of uh, things like that as well. I see black people discriminate against black people because one is darker than the other, you know. Um, look, you, you guys know about this stuff. You guys aren't, aren't new to the world, right? Uh, um, you know, God forbid you call a Spanish person a Puerto Rican or vice versa, World War III just breaks out, right? There's all kinds of biases that people have, you know, and we just got to, you know, we got to be aware of them, but we can't consider it and we should not even discuss any kind of things like that. Because when we're searching for homes, we're searching for homes based on the criteria of the building and what they could afford and the area that they're looking we do not look for areas based on who lives there, though. The town name or the section of town, okay? Not, oh, I want to live by these people or I don't want to live by these people. <laughs> You're moving to the wrong state. New Jersey is the most densely populated state in the nation. We're the melting pot, you know? You tell me where these people don't live or these people live, you know? It, it ain't happening. People are free to live wherever the hell they want if they could afford you know, um, they can live wherever they want. So uh, if you tell me where it is that you want me to search for a home, I'll look for a home there. But I'm not going to engage any conversation with anybody based on I don't want to live by these people or those people or we're not selling to these people. Or those uh, 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 we're not even going there. OK, um, now. Rarely are you going to come across somebody who's going to just start blurting out right things like that. Oh, I don't want to live by these people, or those people. I, I would say I've been in real estate since early 2004, late 2003, and uh, I would say that people came out right and made statements like that to me in all that time, twice. Actually, no, third time. There was there was one I wasn't really considering. It was it was actually an interesting case. Um, I was showing a house. I had a listing uh, in in uh, in Roselle. Really nice house. A uh, big property. And uh, this girl, she came, I showed her the property, uh, walked around. It was a huge lot. She loved it. Uh, inside this house, this guy maintained this house perfect. It was a beautiful house. Um, and then as we were coming out and I'm putting the lockbox back, you know, putting the keys back in the lockbox that's on the railing. And we're talking and she's like, you know, I love the house. I love the yard. It's absolutely, she, we're talking about the house and the features that she liked and didn't like. And she was like, now, just if we can pick it up and put it in, an, in a better neighborhood, she's like in a different or in a different neighborhood. She's like, I noticed when I came here, I came from the parkway. So I had to come around and then I went by. We have these fast food joints over here. And she's like, listen, I don't want to live, live by any uh, 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 fried chicken places. And there's too many black people that live in this neighborhood. And I'm, I'm like, I'm looking at her. I'm Now I'm just leaning against the railing. I'm not saying anything. I'm just looking at her and I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, what is this girl's deal? Keep in mind, this girl was black. And she's making these statements. And I'm like, what the hell's going on here? Is she trying to punk me or something? You know, she's like, I don't want to live by black people or, you know, and, and she's like, like making all these like uh, racist, uh, stereotypical comments, you know, about fried chicken places and all kinds of crap like that. And I'm just like, is she a tester? Hood has undercover volunteers that they call testers that they pose and act like they are clients that are looking for houses or selling houses 
They're testing you to see if you chime in and how you answer on co in conversations to see if you're going to engage in discriminatory rhetoric. All right. And then they would file charges against you. They'd report back to HUD, put a report and file charges. Now, you may think, well, how is that legal? Isn't that entrapment? No, it's not because they don't work for HUD. They're volunteers that are trained by HUD on how to trip you up. Okay. <clears throat> now, these people, they could be the same color as you or the opposite. They could be the same sex as you or the opposite, the, uh, or your sexual orientation or the opposite. They could, they could be straight. They could be gay. They could be what have you, you know. And this is why it works, though, because, look, if, if you're a black person, you're talking to another black person like that. Or if you're a white person talking to another white person, you may be more comfortable engaging in that kind of a rhetoric. Right. So this is why they try to trip you up with things like this. So the person, you know, I, I'm listening right now to these words coming out of a black girl's mouth. And she's talking about discriminating against black people. And I'm just like, wait, what? <laughs> you know? And so it didn't, you know, uh, it was really odd because she was throwing how she was throwing them all out. Check this out. She wasn't a tester. She actually ended up buying a house from me. She just did not know how to explain what it was that she was looking for. And the way that she was talking came out so racist, you know, um, and uh, but I understood later on when I found out her situation. You know, she was a she's a young girl. She has two uh, she has two younger identical twin sisters and she just became the instant mother of them because both of her parents just died in an accident. And so she, this girl's loaded. She's under stress and she's looking for a house because she couldn't afford to continue living in uh, northern New Jersey in a very prominent town that they were living in uh, where uh uh, where their where their parents you know had good paying jobs and you know they, so she's trying to find something that's a good neighborhood but is also a a mixed neighborhood I guess is what she was trying to describe but it came out really racist the way she said it but either way I still cannot look for a mixed neighborhood of people because I cannot search for homes based on who lives there. So I, you know, so then I, I just kind of like flip the switch on her and start asking, well, do you have any idea where it is that you want to live? You know, she's like, well, I'm not too familiar about here, but I heard about these areas. I was like, how about this? How about I search and get a couple of homes that meet your criteria in different areas, in different towns, and then we'll go see the houses and then you could drive around the neighborhood and see if it's a place that you want to be, see if it's a place that you like, and then we'll go from there, you know? Um, and then we did that and I showed her a lot of houses uh, and we, we eventually found something. But sometimes the words, the way they come out of people's mouths, it can be a little shocking or put you off a bit. Just make sure you're not chiming in on any of that rhetoric, even if you're just trying to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, you're a client, you know, and just trying to, please them. you know, we can't talk about that stuff. And if they get outright, you know, like. Uh, talking nasty stuff that you shouldn't be listening to. Um, just tell them, listen, you got to stop. You know, we're, we're not, we're not talking like that, but uh, uh, most people I've come across, they're not like that. I, I've, I've had two people that were actually like that in all the years I've been in real estate. Okay. Um, and they, if anything, they would have felt comfortable talking to me, you know, but they weren't, you know, so I had two people in all that time that I had to deal with. Uh, yeah. If a person approaches you and they use the term diverse, I just, you know, I just want to move into a diverse location or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, area. Where's and that? I, I, that's what I'm about to ask you. How do you, how do you handle that? Where's how, that? Where is that? Did you have an idea? I mean, we're in New Jersey. New Jersey's diverse. Anywhere? No, I mean, you got to narrow it down, Mr. Kress. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I, well, you got to have these conversations with people like that without getting deep into it and say, well, did you have any ideas where it is that you want it to be? The reason I ask is that people throw that word around a lot. Well, well you know what? Um, uh, I can search for homes based on the criteria that you're looking for in the house and the price range. Now, when it comes to areas, I could search for areas based on features that you may be looking for, maybe close to the highway, close to schools or churches or whatever, things like that. But I can't search for homes based on who lives in an area. I would be breaking the law. And listen, I'm not risking my license to even engage in that conversation. 
with you on that. So if, if you are searching for an area based on who lives there, we're not going to have that discussion. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you right now, Mr. And Mrs. Seller or buyer. Okay. Okay, um, I could search for homes based on your price range, the criteria, maybe the the town uh, features or something like that, but not based on who lives in an area. It, it's, it could be deemed discriminatory and I'm not losing my license over such thing and I'm not engaging in such rhetoric, okay? Um, so let's, uh, my job is hard enough finding you this much house in this price range, you know? So now you want me to throw in, now I gotta examine who lives in the area? Yeah, come on. Yeah. Right. Mr. Kaminsky. Yes. W would it be okay if they said something vague like that to search in an area that has a higher population of people, higher density of people? Well, I don't care because... what they say. I'm not trying to say <laughs> it, though. You know? Okay. You know? Um, I mean, I, I mean, I've got it. Be I've got it before uh, where uh, it, it, where it's pretty common, where it's I would be engaging in illegal discussions, but the, the people that are talking, I got it a lot. And it's not people that are, I, I don't wanna say they're discriminating, but they, they like, here, let me give you an example. I, I've, get, I've got Hispanic people that they don't speak English too well and they want to live only by other Hispanic people where they feel comfortable in their community, where they got the ethnic food stores, where they go shopping, where their churches and stuff like that. I, I've had Indian people that feel comfortable living by other Indian people. They want to be in the in the sections of town because there are there are areas where people of the same background tend to gravitate towards. I mean, look, look at Islam. You got a place there that they lovingly call it Little India, you know, down there by Oak Tree Road. You know, if you talk to Indian person over there, they're like, oh, it's like little India. You know, I mean, if I if that came out of my mouth, trying to refer to that area of town as little India, I'd be like the the racist, uh, you know, <laughs> so I'm not going to get I'm not going to engage in that. But look, we do have sections of town that are named like that. You know, you've got the you got the Portuguese section of Newark. You know, you got the, you know areas of town, you know, uh, that, uh, that have been come to be known as uh, a name that they call it by or a nickname that it's been branded. Uh, the local community knows it as the Italian section, the uh, whatever. But really anybody can live anywhere they want to, you know. We just cannot be making the decision for them where they should be living based on any of those criteria. Now, when it comes to steering, steering is a practice where you're making the decision where somebody should live. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're limiting their options in the properties that you're showing and where you're showing them. Um, now, you may not be doing it for discriminatory reasons. I'll give you an example once where I could have been accused of steering, uh, but discrimination was the furthest thing from my from my mind. I was trying to help the guy out actually. Um, it was actually this this guy. He worked. He worked a lot. He was a hard worker. The guy saved his saved his money. He saved a lot of, a lot of money up, and he was looking to buy a uh, a brand new two family house in Elizabeth. This uh, this guy was Hispanic. His English was uh, was very rough, you know, and but he could communicate with me, and um, so I was helping him try to find a home and. He wanted to buy this one house. It was a two family house, new construction for $600,000 down the port. I'm like, dude, for this kind of money, I could get you a house in Elizabeth, a, a, a house in Westfield, you know? And I, I was like, I could find you a really nice house in Westfield for that, you know? Now that could be construed as steering. Why am I trying to get him out of that area and direct him towards another area? If I was trying to do it for, you know, discriminatory reasons. But then again, intent does not matter in order to be found guilty for discrimination. All somebody has to prove is that a discriminatory act had occurred. And what is steering? When we're trying to direct somebody to live in a certain area. Now, I wasn't trying to do it for malicious reasons. I was like, I knew that that house is not going to be worth $600,000 in a few years. You know, uh, I, he was trying to buy this. $600,000, two family house down by second Ave down the port in, in Elizabeth. You know, I was like, it's not staring. If you tell him that in that particular note that 
maybe six years down the line, it won't be worth what you're paying for. Where's my crystal ball? <laughs> How do you know that? You know, I'm I, asking, I know, I know, it from, I I know it from experience. I can tell you that's going to happen. But can well, I? Well, that's why I hide you for your experience. Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but can I definitively say that that's going to happen? No, you can't. I can't. Um, I, I got a pretty good idea, but I can't. And okay. so he bought the house and he put down 200 grand cash that he saved up wow. when he okay. bought that house. And then the market changed. Property values started going down. He wanted to sell. Oh. And I was like, okay, I'll try to help you sell. I was like, but you're going to be losing money, man. I was like, I, I, if you don't have to, I don't see. Oh, no, no, I, I want to sell the property values going down. How long am I going to have to keep this property? I was like, okay, okay. So we tried to uh, price it and put it back on the market and property values were cut in half. Okay. And even then I was having a tough time finding a buyer to purchase when the market was going down. Eventually we really slashed it. We really slashed the price because we came to the decision, hey, this is going to be a short sale if you sell it. You're going to be losing out. I suggest that you don't sell, but if you want to sell, it's, it's going to be a short sale. So it shouldn't matter at this point because you're not getting any of your money back at this point. Um, so that 200 grand, gone. Um, and the, th the interesting thing is when we finally lowered it to a price that we got buyers interested in that started setting up appointments, unfortunate fella, uh, a car in front of his house got bombed with a moth -moth cocktail. <laughs> you, you know, the, a bottle filled with gasoline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a lot of gang activity down there and uh, somebody blew up a car in front of his house. So when I go to show the house the next time, I'm like, oh, my God, because, you know, he said they cleared up the car. The car was gone. You know, the police moved it, you know, after uh, the fire department put it out and all that. But there was a big burnt out. It looked like a war zone. There was a big burnt charred mark on the ground around where the car was. And it was like, oh, man. Yeah, showing a house like that. What happened here? Now, I can't lie and just say it was a car fire. Yeah. You know, somebody, remember, if somebody asks you, you have to be honest. You know, I don't have to volunteer any information about that, but if they ask, you have to be honest with them. Uh, so, I mean, they could easily look it up. A car got firebombed by a gang in front of his house, you know. So, anyway, he eventually decided, uh, I told him, really, if you don't need to sell, after that, I was like, Listen, I think this is some kind of sign here. I don't think that you should be selling this house at this point. Hold on to it. A market will eventually recover and come back up as long as you can afford your payments on your house, which he could. He was just getting scared by the prices in the market and where it was going, you know. But uh, he held on to the house. He ended up holding on to it, which, which is good because the markets are bouncing back now, right? So he could eventually sell it now at a uh, probably get his money back soon. Because we're kind of close to those uh, 2006 uh, peak market price uh, prices right now. So uh, just, just a little tip for you guys right now. We're in 2021. I just took the CMA workshop from that Ottawa group and the advanced workshop that they have for valuing properties. And we were discussing about, we were learning about how to dictate if a market is going to be rising or falling and all that. And these guys do research for all these Fortune 500 companies, retirement plans, all these other different companies. And he gave us a little tip here. He said that uh, we are going to see another uh, a market crash, but it's not going to be as bad as the last one. Um, he's expecting a dip in prices probably in about two, uh, 2022. Uh, and he said that it's going to drop about 14% in value. And he said, but it's going to bounce back up about four. So this is coming from, uh, from an appraiser who does these market predictions based on all of the data that they gather. Is he 100% accurate in it? Well, they're usually pretty, pretty damn close uh, based, based on their historical. So that's why I just wanted to share that with you. So yeah, real estate market right now, we got interest rates that are that are still low, even though they're climbing now, you know, prices of everything are climbing now. So as inflation goes up, what's eventually going to happen? People are going to be able to afford less. So what's that going to do to the value of properties? Bring it down. It's going to drop. It's going to bring them down. Yeah. All right. Uh, 
that's a discussion for another class. So let's get back to this. Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 deals with housing. Title VIII is the Federal Fair Housing Act section of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 that deals with housing. Um, it does have some exemptions, except for race, of course. Uh, type of property covered is only residential property, but includes vacant land used for residential use. And here's the protected classes and the added protected classes. All right, the next one, denying people membership or limiting their participation in a multiple listing service or real estate brokers organization or other facility relating to the sale or rental of dwelling. So basically we went over this before. I told you about the different types of realtors associations. We don't just have realtors that we're all realtors. We find ways to find our, point out our differences, right? We've got the African American Association of Realtors. We have the Hispanic Association of Realtors. We have the Asian American Association of Realtors. We have Women's Council, but none of them can deny me membership. That would be discrimination that yeah. under, under this federal law, right? So, but none of them would deny me. They want my money. They want my my dues, <laughs> you know. Uh, but if, but if they were to, I could file a suit against them under what federal law? Chairman. The Federal no, Fair Housing Act. Is fair state. housing. Sorry, I'm yeah. saying Chairman Act. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> <Federal Fair Housing. laughs> See, it's a lot of different laws. We, we need to study these laws. We're taking notes on them, but we got to study it. Right? Yeah. Like everybody, everybody so far, everything I, I explain in class, everybody understands everything before we go on to this next topic, right? I haven't gone over anything that you were clueless about through this class. So, no. so everything is like, there's no rocket science here. It's just a lot of information to take in. That's why you guys really need to study this stuff. Look, we're only on the third chapter, fourth chapter. <laughs> so there's a lot more to come. We got 21 chapters we got to go over. So highlight or put a line now separating this un underneath that bullet point from the rest of the page where it says exemptions to the Federal Fair Housing Act. Now we're going to go over what some of the exceptions are. This federal law does have exceptions to it. Um, now, let me just read through them before you start asking questions as to why do they have those exceptions. Sometimes it's not so apparent and other times it, it's kind of obvious why they have the exceptions carved out. So let's just uh, go through and see what those exceptions are. Um, let me see if I have them here in the slideshow at all. Okay. Uh, yeah, these are ones that we're getting to on the next page, though. But so, all right, so let's go over what some of the exemptions to the federal law are. And they are the sale or rental of a single family home is exempt when the home is owned by an individual who does not own more than three such homes at one time, meaning they're pretty much dealing in rental businesses. Um, and A, a real estate broker or salesperson, basically a licensee, is not involved in the transaction. And B, discriminatory advertising is not used. If the owner is not living in the dwelling at the time of the transaction or was not the most recent occupant, only one such sale by an individual is exempt from the law within any 24-month uh, period. The rental of rooms or units is exempt from an owner occupied one to four family dwelling. Dwelling units owned by religious organizations may be restricted to people of the same religion if the membership in the organization is not restricted on the basis of any of the protected classes, race, color, religion, uh, national origin, disability, and familiar status, familial status. And a private club that's not open to the public may restrict the rental of its occupancy or lodgings to its members, provided that those uh, uh, that the facility is not operated commercially. All right. Now, highlight in 1974, an amendment added sex as a protected class, and in 1988, a new classes uh, were added: those with mental and physical disabilities, including AIDS and familial status, family members under the age of 18. 
although alcoholics and persons in treatment are considered a protected class. We could just highlight that. We don't need to highlight drug abusers are not, nor are those who pose a threat to the health or safety of others. Highlight housing intended for older persons is exempt from the familial status requirement if it's solely occupied by people 62 and older. And for that, I'm gonna go back to the slideshow here. So what is familial status? That means that you have children under the age of 18, Family. but that also covers pregnant women. Okay. Uh, we need to know these laws. You know, I, I had a situation one time where I had a, where I had a guy, I was representing the renters. Uh, it was a husband and wife and they had two children and the wife was clearly pregnant. One was on the way. And the, we had to meet the owner of the condo to let us in to, sh uh, to show it, all right? And then as they're looking through the, through the unit, the owner pulls me to the side and he's like, I'm not renting to them. I was like, excuse me? He said, I'm not renting to them. You see her belly? She's going to pop any day now. That's exactly what he said to me. So I, I, I pulled him aside. I was like, shh, lower your voice. I'm like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, I'm not going to rent. I'm not renting to them. Look, there's already four of them here. And uh, she's going to have another kid soon. She's like, uh, he's like, I'm not going to get in trouble for renting to them. I said, like, how are you going to possibly get in trouble? He's like, oh, well, uh, Roselle has a, a city ordinance. Or is it Roselle or Roselle Park? I think it was Roselle Park. Uh, has a city ordinance that you can't rent. You can't have uh, more than two people per bedroom. And this is only a two bedroom condo. And I was like, well, first of all, they're in compliance right now. That, that child is not here yet. And, and he's like, yeah, but I'm not gonna get in trouble when she has that baby that uh, for renting to too many people. I was like, well, first of all, that child's not here yet. So you can't discriminate based on her be being pregnant. And he said, and even when that child is born, you do not count an infant as an occupant. Um, and he's like, yeah, sure. You're gonna say whatever you want because you just wanna earn a commission. See, we're, I'm trying to interpret the law for this guy so he don't get in trouble. You know, I'm telling him, you better you know, keep your mouth shut and not to talk too loudly. Because you start telling them this, they're going to turn around and slap you with a lawsuit so fast it's going to make your head spin. You know, so I told him I told him that. And uh, I said, you better check with your attorney before you start making statements like that. And um, so he did. He checked with his attorney and his attorney, uh, because he didn't want to take my word for it. Uh, and his attorney told him that you cannot count an infant. Uh, even when the baby is born, you cannot count an infant as an occupant until they reach 24 months of age. All right. So basically they were, they would be able to live there for two years after the baby's born, you know, um, but it was coming soon. You know, she was, she was, she was about to pop any day, but it was just really disturbing the way he said that. I'm not writing to her. You see her? She's about to pop any day now. I'm like, Jesus Christ, dude, you know, um, the stuff that comes out of people's mouths sometimes, man. Yeah. You know, anyway, um, there's an example of possible discrimination, but I diffused the situation. They ended up actually renting from him. So it's a good thing I told him to talk to his attorney first before he said anything. You know, I mean, his uh, his real his own realtor. You know, he could have talked to them too, but you know, I had him go talk to his attorney. You know. And um, he confirmed it. So then he ended up renting to them. They only wanted to rent for uh, a short period anyway, so that they could save up enough money so that they, they could eventually buy their own house for their new growing family, you know? Um, but interesting, I'd like to share that with you because when we get to the New Jersey law against discrimination, um, we have to give a document to the owners at the time we get a listing that talks about federal and the state anti-discriminatory laws. Anybody remember what that document's called? No? The Attorney General's Memorandum. It's called the mm -hmm. Attorney General's Memorandum. You guys know what an Attorney General is? It's the highest law enforcement officer in the region, okay? So every state has their own state Attorney General. So the state Attorney General is the highest law enforcement officer in the state. We also have an attorney general for our country. That's the highest law enforcement officer in the country. 
Okay. Um, so uh, the attorney, an attorney general's memorandum, a memorandum is a fancy word for a notice. It's a notice coming from the highest law enforcement officer in the state that this that tells people that they cannot discriminate if they're offering housing for sale or lease. This is why we only give that document to sellers and landlords. We don't give them to buyers and renters. Buyers and renters can discriminate all they want. They could choose where they want to live, who they want to live near. But if you're offering real estate for sale or rent, you cannot discriminate on who you're going to be selling it or renting it to for any of the protected classes anyway, which we've gone over a bunch of the protected classes, but we're not done. So let's uh, continue here. So here are exemptions under the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968, where people can, it's not considered discrimination, okay, or where they cannot discriminate. So you can't discriminate based on their familial status. Now, this one is not considered discrimination against people because of their familial status. Senior housing, we highlighted the lines uh, housing intended for older persons is exempt from the familial status requirement if it's solely occupied by those 62 and older. I want you to write in the margin next to that senior housing. And the rest of the paragraph below it, I want you to write next to it 55 plus community because the remainder of the paragraph below that line describes what a 55 plus community is. So the, the last line you highlighted is senior housing. I want you to write senior housing next to it and maybe draw an arrow next to that, that line. And then I put a bracket around the remainder of the paragraph with an arrow to the, uh, to the margin that says 55 plus community. That, so now you got it shown that that's the 55 plus community. Here, I'll, sh I'll show you basically what I'm, what I'm talking about here, what I did. Okay, so you see what I did there? I put a little bracket around it. I wrote senior housing and then I wrote 55 plus community. I put a bracket around the margin of that, the remainder of that paragraph. All right, so back to the slideshow. On the slideshow, here is what a 55 plus community is. Or, or well, senior housing and 55 plus communities are exempt from the familial status requirement and it's not considered discrimination against people with children uh, because these communities are intended to be for older persons, housing for older persons. Uh, so it must comply with HUD's rules and they have to post that it complies with HUD's, HUD's guidelines and that the intent that housing is to be a 55 plus or senior community or housing for older persons the way that they refer to it. Um, so what is a senior housing? We highlighted the line, it's housing occupied solely by people 62 and older, and it complies with HUD's rules for housing meant for older persons. What is a 55 plus community? 55 plus community, the rest of this paragraph basically says what I have here on the slide, but I highlight just the, the main key points here. If 80% of its units are occupied by at least one person that's 55 years or older, and the housing a facility or community posts and adheres to policies that demonstrate its intent to be housing for older persons, 55 and older, all right? So um, senior housing is strictly for people living there 62 and older. If I'm not 55 and older, can I live in a 55 plus community? If, if you're, you're not 55 and older, I would think so, as long as 80% has um, someone above that age in each uh, apartment. Okay. Well, what, what if there isn't somebody 55 or older in the apartment? Can I, how about this? Forget about just living there. Can I own, uh, or can I buy a, a condo in a 55 plus community? being being uh being younger than 55 no no okay. no you can't nope. can i own a condo in a 55 plus community and not be 55 or older no 
I can. How? How? Well, maybe I was living there with a parent and the parent died and they left it to me. So it's grandfather to you. Well, at one point, there was somebody there that was 55 or older that owned it, but they left it to me. They willed it to me. And so then I I could continue living there. Look. Okay. Look what the rule is. As long as 80% of the units in the in the building or complex are occupied by at least one person 55 and older. You could have okay. units there that don't have anybody that's 55 or older there. But the guidelines for HUD though, in order to be considered 55 plus, at least 80% of those units have to have at least one person 55 and older. Okay. So but can you purchase it as a younger person and have the occupant? No. That was my first question. That was my first okay, question. I didn't hear that. <laughs> you cannot you cannot purchase in a 55 plus. I wish, I wish you could get some <laughs> nice homes. I, I'm not, look, 55 yeah. plus communities aren't yeah. old age homes. Okay. Um, you could have condominiums. Uh, sometimes they have assisted uh, assistance there, yeah. like nursing and other stuff like that available in these and uh, amenities that, that would be good for seniors in these uh, 55 plus communities. But um but that's not always the case. Plus, it doesn't have to be a building, uh, you know, like a, 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 a condominium single building. They could be separate standalone houses in the community, single family houses. And look, I, I've seen a lot of Monmouth and Ocean County have tons of these 55 plus communities that are gorgeous. I mean, ocean, we're talking oceanfront properties uh, that you know, these things would be million dollar plus. And in the meantime, because it's 55 plus community and subsidized and all that stuff, you're getting these things for like 380 or 350, you know, and it's like for that shit, I can't wait till I'm 55. <laughs> you know? like the, yeah. the question. So let's say my husband turns 55 and I have plus five years to turn 55. Uh-huh. So uh, can he... Can he buy? And I mean, yes. If I move, look, as long as at least one person is 55 or older that lives there. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So you could purchase that unit if you're 55 or older. Yeah. Only one person has to be, the other spouse doesn't have to be. Look, uh, I I mean, she's, yeah, my my parents would have been able to do this. You know, My, my dad's gone now, but my dad was 20 years older than my mother. (laughs) <laughs> you know so what, what are they not gonna she can't live there because he's uh, he could uh, he would be old enough and she couldn't you know so even if it's a year or two uh, like you're you're saying in your example but um yeah so that's the rule on it okay all right so let's now talk about jones versus mayor um let me see if i have something about that on the slide or not nope i don't but anyway uh before we go to jones versus mayor uh, when we get a listing in a 55 plus or senior housing community, we need to have this form filled out. Here's the one uh, courtesy of Garden State MLS. Uh, this is their, uh, their, when we get a listing, if we just put a listing for a senior community or, or, or 55 plus community and we put it in the MLS, it's going to get taken down and we're going to get fined unless this form is accompanying it because we are discriminating based on familial status if you do not have this form filled out by the owner and the facilities management showing that it is a housing for older persons uh, uh, certification by the FHA, all right? And then you would check off one of these here. And it basically says that that's the intent of this housing and that it's in compliance with HUD's rules. And it's signed by the owner, the facility managers, et cetera. Okay. Very important, guys. If you get a listing in a 55 plus community, you can't just get a listing and put it in the MLS and then say, you know, age restricted. That's discriminatory. You have to have this form as well filled out in order for that listing to be good. All right. Otherwise, the MLS will find you. All right. Now we're going to talk about Jones versus Mayor. Um, now, Jones here, let's read about this. Here's an example of what I was talking about when we were talking about um, when two laws 
cover the same topic, the more restrictive rule will prevail. So in this example of Jones versus Mayer, the basic thing is talking about the, the concept of no, there's no exceptions for race. And when two laws cover the same topic, we always fall back on the 1866. You cannot a law against discrimination. When it comes to race, you can never discriminate based on someone's race. So uh, the second significant fair housing development of 1968 was a Supreme Court decision in the case of Jones versus Alfred H. Mayer Company. Jones was an African-American who sued Mayer, alleging that he refused to sell him a home in St. Louis County, Missouri, solely on the basis of his race. In its ruling, the court upheld, highlight, the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which prohibits all racial discrimination, private or public, in the sale and rental of real property. So the importance in this decision rests in the fact that while the 1968 federal law has some exemptions to it, uh, to individual homeowners and certain groups, and eight, the 1866 law prohibits all racial discrimination without exception. So despite any exemption in the 68 law, an aggrieved person may seek a remedy for racial discrimination under the 1866 law against any homeowner regardless of whether the owner employed a real estate broker or advertised the property in a discriminatory fashion. Where race is involved, no exceptions apply. Now, HUD has an equal housing opportunity poster that says that any business offering housing or housing services has to display this equal housing poster. So your real estate broker should have it displayed somewhere. And failure to display this poster is evidence that you engage in discriminatory activities. So basically what happens, who investigates uh, accusations of discrimination for real estate? HUD. Under federal law, it's HUD. HUD investigates. They got their own investigators, they got their own judges, they got their own courts. Um, now, the first thing that an investigator does when they go out to investigate discrimination is they go to your office and when they're going to ask you questions, before they start even asking you questions, they look around and they see if this poster is available. This is what the poster looks like. See, it has the house with the equal sign in it. If it's not displayed somewhere in the office, they stop their investigation and you're guilty. Wow. Pretty low threshold of being found guilty of discrimination, right? Yeah. You just don't have the poster there and you're guilty. All right. Um, so let's highlight the last line uh, on the page, the last sentence on 65. When HUD investigates a broker for discriminatory practices, it considers failure to display the poster evidence of discrimination. And then there's the picture of that poster on page 66, the, the one that I just had up there in the slide. This one, that's on page 66. All right, so let's do this. So Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act 1968 is part of the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. And it covers blockbusting, steering, and redlining, even though they're not directly mentioned in that law. Blockbusting is uh, sometimes called panic peddling. So you need to know both of these terms, blockbusting and panic peddling. Now, Blockbusting is using discrimination as the tool to play on a homeowner's fear of a protected class. Um, the book, what we highlighted here is in the second paragraph on page 67, the first sentence that uh, blockbusting known as panic peddling is inducing homeowners to sell by making representation regarding the entry or prospective entry of minority persons into the neighborhood. Instead of saying minority persons, I'm gonna use the words protected class because it's not just a matter of minority persons. Look, uh, it's any of the protected classes. You could have blockbusting that occurs. Uh, some of the cases that you may see today uh, more prevalent would be like a situation where 
somebody knocks on your door and they say, listen, uh, they're, they're, they're trying to do, they're trying to engage in blockbusting and they knock on your door and say, Hey, did you hear who's moving next door to you? You know, now automatically, what are you picturing? Who's moving next door? Do you have a picture in your head of somebody? Well, what if I were to tell you that they're putting a, a um, halfway house next door for recovering drug addicts? Is that a protected class? Yes. Yes, yes it is. See, so it's not always based on somebody's race or religion or anything like that. That's why I don't want to say minorities. I want to say based on a protected class because those are all protected classes. Uh, so that would be a more accurate way of describing the, the people that's targeted using blockbusting. Um, or, or, you know, so they could say, yeah, they're, go they're going to be putting in a, a house there for recovering drug addicts or, um, or here based on what's another protected class. Um, uh, people with illnesses, right? For medical reasons, including persons with AIDS. Well, what about if I told you that next door, they're going to convert that into a house for uh, a place where all, all the people with mental problems are going to come and select a daycare for people with mental problems. Okay. Would you want those people to move in next door to you? Do you think that they're going to be driving down the values or desirability of homes in that neighborhood? Okay. See, you're building on a fear of a protected class. That's still a protected class. They have a medical uh, issue there, right? Um, so let's see. So blockbusting don't automatically go to like race and color with those things. You know, there's a lot of different protected classes. So uh, blockbusting is sometimes called panic peddling. We need to know that. And it's basically using discrimination against who? A protected class. It's using the protected class as the reason, but who are they using discrimination against? The homeowner. So blockbusting is using discrimination against the homeowner to try to scare them into selling. That's why they call it panic peddling. They're trying to, they're trying to peddle fear to try to get you to sell your home. All right. So it's using the protected classes to drum up the fear to get you to sell your home. All right. So that's what blockbusting is it's just, and who is it discriminate against the homeowner steering is another form of discrimination i spoke a little bit about it earlier but let's look at the definition i have up here we're going to highlight the first sentence under steering on page 67 there but um i'm not going to go through that whole thing i'm not going to have you highlight that whole thing because i don't like the last sentences that they put in there which basically uh goes with the assumption that everybody's a racist you just don't know it you know um but steering can be subtle and you can be found guilty of steering even if it wasn't your intention to discriminate against somebody but remember i told you that in order to be found guilty of discrimination it does not need to be your intent Somebody just needs to prove that a discriminatory act had occurred, right? Like the guy I was trying to help in Elizabeth with buying that $600,000 two-family house. I said, you could get a house like, you could get a good house, a nice house in Westfield for that money, basically better area and all that, you know? I mean, I could have been accused of steering for that. Okay. You know? But that wasn't my intention to be discriminating. I was trying to help the guy out, you know? Uh, but that, that, but that, that's irrelevant. You know, if this guy had a chip on his shoulder and if his first go to thing is everybody's a racist around him, you know, um, and that I, I could have been found guilty of discrimination on there, you know. So I'm just showing you guys how easy it is. Uh, so you can't help your your client out by suggest by suggesting that at all, because it seemed like a fine line between helping them and, you know, it is. It is. Um, that's why. Uh, that's why it's difficult. It's difficult for us. 
we have to walk this fine line between all these po uh, political correct act, um, ways that we act and talk and speak, you know, because there's some bad apples out there that do things negative. Well, some people now, they just go to the, their first go-to is, well, they're assuming that you're doing the, the evil thing, you know, instead of that you're trying to help them, you know. Some people just got chips on their shoulders, too. You, know? you, got, you got some people out there that, you know, the, everything is about race. Everything is about discrimination, you know. Um, so we have to just do our best to try to talk to people in a way that it cannot be in any way um, deemed discriminatory or construed as that. And that could be difficult sometimes. Um, you're trying to legitimately help somebody and you know somebody uh, can just make an accusation, you know, and your intent was to help them and it was honorable. Uh, you were just trying to help them out, but that's irrelevant, you know. Uh, once again, your intent is irrelevant. As long as somebody can prove a discriminatory act had occurred, boom, you're guilty. So steering, and I'm going to show you, steering is one where you can find yourself in that situation pretty easy. Remember I told you guys about doing the, um, uh, showing people properties based on the commission that uh, that's being offered to you and you're not showing people properties because it's not offering enough, a high enough commission. They're offering low commissions on those properties. So you don't even, even introduce them to your client to show them. And if they get draw on the map and they could see that all those properties that you didn't show them were from some certain area or neighborhood, they could, they could put together a pretty good case that you were steering them away from that area. And then, uh, you know, let people come to their own conclusions. Was that discrimination or not? You know, and it's pretty easy to sway people to think you're discriminating against them because you didn't want them to live in that neighborhood for discriminatory reasons. When in fact, that was the furthest thing from your mind. You were just looking at the green. That's the only color you were looking at, the money, you know. And that's why I told you guys, you know, to do those um, exclusive buyer agency agreements that show the minimum commission you're willing to work for and whether they want you to show them properties that don't pay that minimum commission or not, because they'll have to pay the difference out of their pocket. And then that way you don't have to worry about filtering properties like this based on commission. And then if, and then if somebody, it could end up term, turning into a discriminate, discrimination case. And that was like, wait, how did we get here? <laughs> you know, oh, because I didn't discuss my, what I wanted to, my minimum value that I'm willing to work for, um, what the commission was, you know? So that was, uh, that was an idea that I gave you guys to fill out that exclusive buyer agency agreement that way to try to prevent um, any accusations of uh, uh, steering if, you, if you're filtering out properties based on um, how much commission is being offered, which you shouldn't be doing unless they gave you, unless they told you, you know, um, that they're not going to pay that difference in the commission. And then you, uh, and they gave you the go ahead not to show them those properties. Now they can't accuse you of discrimination because they told you not to show them those properties. Okay. So steering is limiting someone's options of where they can live by not showing them all the properties that meet their criteria in an area that they're looking for by channeling home seekers to or away from certain areas or simply not making them aware that homes are available in those areas even. So when the agent is the one who decides where the buyer or renter should live, that could be deemed as a discriminatory act because you limited their options, whether they are aware of it or not, you know? So uh, we get sometimes people that say they wanna move to a certain, you know, they're moving to New Jersey. They're not familiar with the area. They want you to give them a little guidance on what's a good area. What's a, what does that mean, good area? A subjective. <laughs> it is subjective for sure. And anytime something is subjective like that, and you're the one that's now making that determination of what a good area is, um, guess what? You could be found guilty of steering. 
That's why I always try to put it back onto them. Well, did you have any ideas of what these good areas, what do you, what constitutes a good area to you? What do you, well, uh, you know, um, now you could say low crime and things like that, right? Here, check out this situation. I had a situation once when I, when I opened up my office in, uh, in Edison, I had this one girl that came to me because she worked in Edison, but she lived in Newark and she was looking for another apartment in Newark. She had to move out of the one that she was in. So I had her sit next to me uh, in front of the computer while I searched the MLS with her side by side to me. And um, we're going through the properties with her search criteria, bedrooms and all that stuff and the price range. And um, we're going through them and we're like, no, not that one. Okay, that one. Oh, let's look at the pictures. Because sometimes I could tell just from my experience of the pictures uh, by pictures, if, if the room is going to be big or small, you know, it could be a little deceptive or hard to tell that. But through my experience, I could tell. So I'm, uh, I'm, going, I'm going through them. And then I, I skip over a property and then she's like, wait, 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 go back. That one wasn't bad. And I'm like, okay, let's go back. And I was like, oh, okay, let's see. Yeah, the price is good. Let's look at the pictures. Oh, the rooms, they look, they look pretty decent sized. Yeah, this looks like a pretty good property. Let's click on the map. Let's see where it's located. And I was like, oh, that's a pretty rough area. I, mean, I probably shouldn't have said that, but I was like, ooh, that's a pretty rough area. You know, because at the time I did a lot of work for banks and landlords back then in, in, the, in that area. And so I was kind of familiar with the streets. And so these are the words that came out of this girl's mouth verbatim. She said, no, -uh, that ain't a bad area. It's been at least a year since someone got shot there. Mm. All right. So clearly we're on two different planets, me and her, on what constitutes a good area. Yeah. She thought a good area is, it's been at least a year since someone was shot there. So it's a good area. Maybe it is compared to where she's currently living. Yeah. See, see, so those things, you got to look at them. They're a little bit subjective because you got to look at them through the eyes of the person who wants to live there. And so, I mean, I would have, wouldn't have even considered that. I'm like, someone got shot. You know, and she's like, it's, it's been at least a year. So it's cool. You know, and I'm like, somebody got shot ever there. <laughs> you know, So we're on two different planets of what's safe. So this is why it's subjective. And if you're the one that's making that decision where somebody should live, you could be found guilty of steering. Now she knew I wasn't trying to steer, you know, steer her and discriminate against her. I was just trying to help her out. I mean, she was there when I was like, oh, that's a pretty rough area. And, you know, she was like, no. Nah. When she said that, I was like, look, I, I'm not the one that got to live there. You do. I'll show you a house anywhere you want to be, you know? So uh, I, I, I was just familiar with the area because I did a lot of work in that area. You know, she was more familiar with it than me because she lived there already. But, um, if it's okay for her to live there, she's the one that makes the decision, not me. So who am I to say, steer her away from it? You know, even though my intention was, you know, looking out for her safety, you know, I was like, that's a pretty rough area, you know? And she was like, mm -mm. she's like, that's not bad. It's been at least a year since someone got shot there. So uh, I guess compared to where she's at, she's moving up, you know, you got to take those things into, 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 uh, into your, analysis of this now at the same token uh, I, I had another client a uh, guy who was um working in new york very affluent they're looking to buy a very expensive house but they're not sure where they're just moving to new jersey uh but they got kids and they're very specific about what they want they wanted a safe area good schools downtown uh should be uh with modern stores, but with like that old world feel to it, you know, that laid back country feel to it, you know? And um, they were very specific about after school activities for their children uh, and stuff. So I had a lot of work I had to do. Plus it had to be near the train to go to uh, New York because the guy worked in New York. So they had no idea where they wanted to be. So I draw up a couple of plans of uh, how am I gonna find uh, towns that meet all their criteria before we start looking for houses for them, right? Mm -hmm. So I put together a list of towns. Now, one thing that made it kind of difficult for me back then was this was around the time that President Obama first took office and he did something with um, with school reporting systems back then where they used to have school report cards 
all over the United States. And he ordered the Department of Education to remove any reporting or identifying information about schools grading, you know, because schools break it down to even by the grades, the ages, the racial compositions, the ethnicity, the backgrounds, all that stuff of people uh, uh, on their scoring and all that in the schools and the testing, you know, all that stuff was in there. And so he's like, wait a minute, this could be used uh, in a discriminatory way by people. So uh, until we come out with a new way to how we're going to report this information and what information we want to be public, we're going to take it down. So he took it down and they, they, they never put anything up again for several years. So this guy now, he's looking for a property with good schools. How do I find good school systems if there's no school reporting system that shows the performance of the schools anymore? So now I go to websites like uh, greatschools.com that's the website sucks it's all like opinions of parents oh this is a great school because the teacher makes cookies and hands them out in class you know <laughs> <laughs> um so at the time when this was going on uh, i was still married and my and my wife was uh, uh a uh, public educator so i asked her i'm like how do i find out where, where the good schools are what, are what are good schools you know all that information is freaking taken down mm -hmm. And she's like, well, you could you could search you could research uh, blue uh, blue ribbon schools, and so I did, and I found a a search thing on the Star Ledger's website, and uh, Star Ledger had something there about a listing of all the blue ribbon schools in uh, New Jersey. Now, there it's not by district; it's blue ribbon schools. Each school gets ranked, okay. And so now I included that. So I picked the towns that met all of his criteria and that had blue ribbon schools in them. And so I presented it to the guy. I was like, there you go. And he's like, what's this? I'm like, well, here's the towns that meet all your qualifications. Uh, they have all the after school activities near the train, uh, blah, 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 blah. And they got blue ribbon schools. You know, they got the better schools, the blue ribbon schools. The guy goes like this. He looks at it and he's like, I don't want to see any of this blue ribbon school bullshit. And he throws it at me. I, I put a lot of work into researching towns and all this information for this guy, for him just to throw it back in my face like that. You know, he's like, I was like, what's the matter? You know, he's like, do you even know what a blue ribbon school is? And I was like, yeah, it's a good school. And he's like, well, do you know what makes up a blue ribbon school? How, how, they, how they determine if it's blue ribbon? What do you guys think? The grades. Was it by race or state test scores? Okay. So test scores, what else? Income. Income? Yeah, like family income. Well, public, uh, blue, are they public or private schools? Well, well, if you're sending your kids to school, what would you consider to be a good school? What would make what would make it a good school? A school where there's safe is, uh, farm. That's it. No drugs. <laughs> a no diverse, drugs. a diverse school with good uh, good grade averages. Okay. Graduate rate. Uh, graduation rates, uh, uh, testing scores, teacher-student-pupil ratio, so that you have classrooms that aren't, aren't overcrowded, maybe, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The graduation rates of how many of them actually graduate. Um, you know, things like that, right? Uh, you go to private school. Well, 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 the question is, what makes a good school? Okay, so I had all of these blue ribbon schools there. And the guy's like, now he started educating me because apparently he knew and he already knew some areas that he wanted to be in. See, the thing is, I was so excited to get this person as a client for an expensive home that he wanted to buy that I didn't throw questions back on him like I normally would be like not so argumentative uh, per se, but, you know, throwing it back on him to give me feedback. Well, what areas did you have in mind? What do you consider a good school? So instead I played more of a suck up, you know, and that kind of like backfired on me because 
I had to do more research and work on my own. In the meantime, the guy already had an idea, you know, from the people at his work, they gave him idea of areas to start looking in, you know, so he had some knowledge of where he wanted to be. But he tells me, he's like, listen, if you go to Star Ledger website and you go down to where it says data for that, uh, uh, you know, because he already knew where I got my information from. The Star Ledger website is where I got the Blue Ribbon School info. And he's like, well, if you go underneath that, there it says data. It shows you how they determine if something becomes a, a, a Blue Ribbon School based on different criteria, how much weight they put in the different criteria. And although testing scores and graduation rates and things like that were on the list, they were kind of lower on the list. The things that they put above the, that they put the most weight in were how much government subsidies that the school was getting. You know what subsidies are? Donations. Money. How much money that the school is getting from the state and federal government. More money does not make a better school. And this has been proven time and again since the 70s, where we started throwing money at schools all over the United States, especially in, let's forget about the United States, let's just look at New Jersey. You know, some, some of these uh, school districts that get the most money are the poorest performing schools that are out there. You know, so more money at a school does not make it a better school. So he's like, um, Government, how many government subsidies is this school getting? Um, the, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, diversity uh, was the next thing up there. How, how diverse is the school? Like, what kind of word was used? <laughs> those are nice things, you know, to have, you know, sure, the school gets some cash infusions. I, I would say that should be on the lower end of the list, though. Um, diversity, sure. We want our kids to be familiar with different cultures and be diverse and all that stuff. But I don't know. I don't have kids. But if I did, the first thing I'd be looking at is um, testing scores, graduation rates, a teacher student pupil ratio, meaning that there's uh, uh, there's not one teacher for 50 kids. You know, you have some aides in class, you know, so the teacher student pupil ratio, uh, extracurricular activities for the kids, you know, uh, all kinds of stuff like that. And that's what this guy ended up throwing in my face. And he's like, I don't want to see any of this blue ribbon school bullshit. He's like, I want to see how many of them go on to graduate from Ivy League colleges. I'm like, I don't think that information is even available anywhere. You know, uh, there's no database that says how many kids came from this school, went to Ivy League colleges or went from that school to an Ivy League. You know, there's no such database. You know, so needless to say, all my hard work, the guy didn't even work with me yeah uh so i just showed you several clients that i had different uh, different views of how they looked at things and one lesson you should get out of this is uh the extra effort that you put in trying to be such a helpful agent uh will not be considered uh, you know people do not uh, they're not grateful for for this stuff and in in hindsight I probably should have thrown it back on them. So you guys should probe your clients more with a lot of questions to try to get an idea. Uh, because now if I'm making these town profiles too, um, I'm the one that's making the decision of what is a good school or a safe area as well. So even this guy could have accused me of steering. You know, so... I just want to show you how steering, here, let me show you another one. When I started working in, in, in real estate, I started working in West Orange. That's where my office was, where I first started working. And so I, that was my areas, the, the Oranges, Livingston, that whole area in Essex County is where I, was, uh, where I was at. And I had this one girl come to me. She was a single mom, uh, had a little kid that was going to start going to school. And she didn't, make a, uh, she didn't make a lot of money, so she had a limited budget to work with. And she wanted to buy her first house, uh, but it couldn't, it couldn't require a lot of work or maintenance because she didn't know how to do any of that stuff. She told me straight out. And I was like, all right, well, let's see what we got. I said, well, based on the budget and what you're approved for, actually, I think your best bet would probably be to try to get a condo. You don't have to worry about cutting grass or the exterior, exterior maintenance or anything like that. Um, and you could probably get more bang for your buck with a condo. So 
based on the conversation, the dialogue we had, she was in agreement with me. And so I start looking for condos for her in the area because she didn't want to be too far from her job and the school and all that stuff. So I was like, okay. And I started looking for properties and I actually found a lot of good ones in her price range, but she was not pulling the trigger and making an offer on any of them. And I keep asking as I'm showing the property, well, what did you like? What didn't you like? Okay. You, are you interested in this one? You want to make an offer? She's just always like, uh, I want to keep looking. Uh, you know, this one's not, yeah, I, I want to keep looking. I was like, All right. Now I get a call from another real estate agent. The real estate agent uh, was the agent of a property that uh, was a listing that I showed this girl. And the agent had to meet us there to let us in because there was no lockbox or anything on that property. So she met us there. And the agent called me and said, yeah, you know that uh, you had a client that you showed this property, one of my listings. She's like, I just want to check with you first because I don't want to deal with any problems in the transaction, but are you still working with her? Because she just put another offer in. Uh, she put an offer in on another one of my listings with another agent. And I was like, no, I was not aware of that, but thank you very much for bringing it to my attention. Uh, I'm going to give her a call right now. So I called her up and I was like, cheating on me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And wow, she blew up on me. She was like, yeah, because you're not showing me properties in the areas that I'm looking. And bah, 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 bah. I was like, whoa, where's all this coming from? Every time I showed you a property, I'm asking you for feedback. I'm, I'm trying to have dialogue with you. You're just like, oh, we just want to keep looking. But, you know, um, but I keep showing her all these properties. So check this out. She, she was living in East Orange at the time. And she came to me. She's like, look, I want to find a house. You know, I, I want to have a good school in a safer area. I don't want my baby to have to walk by that wall where the uh, gang members and the drug dealers hang out, you know. And so I tried finding towns and areas with better schools, safer areas and stuff like that. What I deemed to be. Check this out. She still bought a house in East Orange, a house that needed work. All the things she told me she didn't need, that she didn't want. Um, and her kid was even going to be going to the same school. But check this out. The house was on the other side of the school, so he didn't have to walk by that wall. So that's a safer school. You know, it doesn't even make sense to me. You know, but trying to find out what's going on here in people's heads sometimes can be a scary thing. <laughs> but um, mm -hmm. we have to probe and ask questions, sometimes ask the same question in different ways to try to see where people are coming from to understand them better to help them find what it is that they're looking for now this girl she could have accused me of steering her because i was the one that was picking the houses in the different areas that i thought were better safer all those terms are subjective right yeah. so and she kind of had a chip on her shoulder. So if, if she wanted to make a formal complaint that I was trying to steer her away from an area, she could have done it, you know? Um, and I probably would have been found guilty even though my intent was, was honorable. Remember I told you, in order to be found guilty of discrimination, your intent is irrelevant, right? So blockbusting, steering, and redlining. You need to know all three of these terms for exams. You will see them on. So lastly, we're going to highlight redlining, the first sentence under redlining, if you don't already have it highlighted. And it's basically refusing when uh, lenders or insurance companies refuse to give somebody loans or insurance as a means of discrimination. Remember the maps with the red lines, they were showing you, they don't want to give loans in these areas because they said they were declining or uh, they were risky to insure. So they don't give them based on that. So even though the people can afford to pay the insurance or the mortgage, they're refusing to give you the loan or the insurance, even though you could afford it. It's discrimination. All right, so here's a little breakdown, uh, and I include the. We're gonna start talking about the New Jersey law against discrimination too. So, let's. Hey, can yeah. I ask you a question quickly? Yep, yep. So, um, 
I wanted to do the refinance. I don't know if it has something to do with, I mean, okay. loan, but um, since um, I work as a traveling nurse, I was, um, you know, it's 1099. And um, basically I tried to put my schedule. So I at least worked at least three days a week, sometimes five, it depends, you know, mm -hmm. but three days a week and I make decent living. But uh, when I want to do refinance, they told me that um, they can count my travel job as a permanent job. So they didn't proceed with refinancing. Okay, well, that, that, that has to deal with the, uh, the type of, of income and stuff. There's no discrimination involved in that, though. Oh. Um, you <laughs> just go to a different lender. Uh, different lenders can, can count incomes uh, from different sources in a different ways. You know? Are they even calculating it properly or right? You know, was it a little mom and pop lender, a local lender? Was it a national lender? Um, Actually, it's the, the, the one that they have mortgage with. But I just yeah, wanted well, to do. Well, hold on a second. Um, you're better off going somewhere else. Usually, the lender that you try that you already have and you try to get a refinancing through, they don't refinance it. Why? Well, let me ask you a simple question. What is refinancing? So, I mean, actually, they they send me a million on. letters. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What? Yeah, yeah, but they send them to everybody. They 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 they're not. They didn't pre-qualify anybody for anything. They're just, they send them out to everybody and anybody, mm. you know. Um, don't need a mortgage, right? What is refinancing though? And they get a lower interest rate. Low interest rate, yeah. Well, they're not, well, how are they lowering the interest rate? Are they lowering the interest rate in your current loan? No, they're giving you a new one. Okay, exactly. It's so refinancing right. is getting a new loan, which pays off your existing loan. Correct. Why would a lender give you a new loan from the same lender at a lower interest rate? It's against, the, it, it doesn't make sense for them to do that. Lenders usually don't do that. That's why you usually, when you're refinancing, you got to go refinance from another lender. You go to a different lender and get them to pay off your current loan at a, at a whatever the current interest rate is. And right now it's probably lower than what you've got already. So that's how it works. Yeah, I didn't think about you that. Off your existing one, and you're getting it at a lower interest rate. That's all it is. So try going to a different lender. Thank you. I'll you're try. <laughs> okay. So let's see. Uh, federal laws. So the enforcement of the anti-discriminatory laws. We have the um, under the federal laws. We have the Civil Rights Act of 1866, uh, and we have the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968. <laughs> Mute that Get background noise. All right. So, um, who enforces the federal laws? HUD. HUD enforces the federal anti discriminatory laws. How long do you have to file a complaint for violation of any of the federal laws? One year. Unless you want to make a federal case out of it, then it's two. Right. Um, now, here's a term you need to know, an injunction, because this will be on exams. Uh, we'll, we'll highlight it here somewhere, too, but let's just go over it on a slide. For some reason, they always have this on state exam. The word injunction, you need to know what it is. Um, it's when a judge forces somebody to do something or refrain from doing something. All right. So an injunction is when a judge orders somebody to perhaps rent to uh, an apartment to somebody who they who uh, the landlord previously denied because they were discriminating against them or something. And the judge will order them, forcing them to rent to them. Uh, or if they were doing some kind of action and the judge wants them to stop doing whatever it is that they're doing, they would order what we call an injunction. So an injunction is when a court orders somebody to do something or refrain from doing something. That's it. Now, let's talk about the LAD. So before we do that, we're going to do our highlighting under enforcement of the federal law. Uh, we're going to highlight the two and a half lines there. Any person who believes that discrimination has uh, or has been any person who believes illegal discrimination has occurred has up to one year after the alleged act to file a charge with the Department of 
Housing and Urban Development, which is HUD, or two years to bring a federal suit. HUD will investigate. And then also underline, HUD will investigate. So who investigates uh, discrimination under the federal laws? HUD. HUD. Okay. And how long do they have to file a complaint? One year. Unless it's federal case. Unless they want to make a federal, take it to federal court, make a federal case out of it, then they have two. Two years. Okay. Um, then on the next paragraph, on the first line, towards the end of the line, we're going to highlight the word injunction. This would order an offender to take action. And I told you, you know, if if you go to uh, to you don't go to federal court, but for violations under the federal law, if you just went to the administrative judge within HUD, they do have maximum limits on the fines that can be charged. So they are listed here. We do not need to highlight them. We do not need to study them. I don't know how you would remember these numbers anyway. Um, so for a first violation, it's um, $21,039 fine. Uh, and $52,596 for a second violation within five years and $105,194 for further violations. See, they're so obscure numbers. I don't know where, how they come up with those obscure numbers, but those would be the fines for uh, if you're found guilty of uh, violating the federal laws for, uh, for discrimination. All right, um, turn the page. On page 68, we have the New Jersey law against discrimination and we have a list of the protected classes there. Uh, but before we go into that, let me just give you the breakdown of New Jersey's law against discrimination. So we call it the LAD for short. That's the New Jersey law against discrimination. What kind of property does the LAD deal with? All real property. Oh, real all real property. That means residential and commercial. It doesn't mm -hmm. deal with personal property. It only deals with real estate, per, uh, residential or commercial. Now, um, complaints are made to the state's attorney general. The state attorney general is the highest law enforcement officer in the state, right? So who enforces the New Jersey laws against discrimination? The Attorney General. Attorney General. Who, enfor who enforces and investigates the federal uh, law violations? HUD. HUD. So HUD investigates the federal laws. Attorney General investigates the violations of the New Jersey laws. Okay. How long do you have to file a complaint uh, if, you, if there's a violation against the New Jersey law against discrimination? 180 days or six months. Okay. Federal law, it's one year. Unless you want to take it to federal court, then it's two. Under the LAD, it's six months or 180 days. Okay. Um, those who interfere with the investigation could be subject to a fine of uh, $500 in the year in prison. The Attorney General's memorandum, this is the document that we give property owners at the time that we get a listing. It informs them that they have to follow the federal and New Jersey's anti-discriminatory laws that tells them, informs them that they cannot discriminate and here are all the protected classes, et cetera. I'm gonna pull that form up and show you in a minute. There's one in the book, but as soon as this book was published, even though this book was just published last year, it's already outdated. <laughs> they, the um, uh, New Jersey came out with an updated LAD or uh, I'm sorry, the updated attorney general's memorandum. Uh, so I have that in the shared Google Drive for you guys. Uh, so if we look in the shared Google Drive under supplemental materials folder, there's one, there's something called the Attorney General's Memorandum 2020. This is the one that came out like a month after they published the book. So um, let me open it up. I'm not gonna open it up from this drive. I'm gonna open it up from my hard drive so that you can see it full screen. So give me one second so I can open this up for you.
contracts disclosures, attorney general's memorandum. There we go. So this is the lad on screen here. This is the attorney general's, mem I'm sorry, not the lad. This is the attorney general's memorandum, okay? Look, it, it, you got the, the seal of the state of New Jersey there. And who does this say that it's coming from? The Office of the Attorney General, Department of Law and Public Safety, Division of Civil Rights. It kind of looks like an email, doesn't it? To property owners from the Attorney General, the date that the memo was dispatched and what is the topic? Housing discrimination laws. Okay. This is the attorney, this is the attorney general's memorandum. Okay. Now we're actually going to go over this document instead of reading a lot of pages on the book. We're actually going to go over this document, which, which covers the protected classes, what the law is. It gives some examples of common uh, uh, problems and issues we come across. Um, and we're going to, we're going to go over that in a moment. Uh, so in the book, let's just highlight the New Jersey law against discrimination, the title, and then highlight protected classes for housing under the New Jersey law now include, and I just put a highlighted box around all those bullets points. So I'm going to skip this page. You're going to skip the next page. We're going to go to page 70. Now, some more things we're gonna go over and we're gonna highlight here are pertaining to this New Jersey law against discrimination. We gotta give, uh, got give the attorney general's memorandum to who? Owners, I mean- uh... Owners, yes. Owners of property at the time we get the listing. It basically informs them that they can, if they're offering housing for sale or lease, they cannot discriminate against anybody. And it goes into detail about who they can't discriminate against, what the protected classes are, uh, according to New Jersey law. And uh, it, it talks, it discusses the federal law, but it talks more about the New Jersey law against discrimination, which has a lot more protected classes. What were the protected classes under the uh, Federal Fair Housing Act of 1960? Uh, I'm sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1866? Race. Race, color, color. national origin, and religion. Religion. Right? Those four. What were the protected classes under the Fair Housing Act of 1968 or Title VIII? Here, let me back up through it. That's a lot more protected classes. Uh, race, color, religion, national origin, sex, people with disabilities, familial status, alcoholics, and persons in treatment are all protected classes. Now, New Jersey, uh, I have a, a list of protected classes in the coming page over here, but before, before I get to that, let's first go over, if somebody violates the New Jersey law against discrimination, what are the fines? What are the penalties? Well, for a first offense, it's up to $10,000. For a second violation, up to $25,000. And for further infractions, up to $50,000. All right, uh, this we need to know for exams. You need to know what the penalties are. For violations of the discrimina discrimination laws or anti-discrimination laws uh, under the LAD, um, what are the penalties? 10, 25, 50,000. 10, 25, 50,000, remember that, okay? So there's a lot of stuff here that we get questions on on an exam. We need to know the federal laws, the protected classes by the laws, we need to know how long somebody has to file a complaint and who do you file the complaint with? Under the New Jersey law, the same thing. How long do you have to file the complaint? Six months or 180 days. Who do you file it with? The attorney general. What kind of property does the, uh, uh, does the lad cover? Real property. All real property. What kind of property does the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866 cover? Residential. 
everything, all property. All property. It even, it even, because j- just remember what happened back then. Lincoln freed the slaves, and he said that everybody has equal rights. You have rights not just to own property uh, that's mm-hmm. for real estate, but you're allowed to own your own clothes on your back, right? Okay. So the 1866 covers all property. And then what kind of property does the Federal Fair Housing Act of 1968 cover? Residential. Residential real estate only. Okay. Housing, right? There's that little hint there, right? Okay. Uh, okay, let's moving on. So basically these slides, I tried to sum up all these study fine points in the slides here because this stuff is spread out all over the book. All right, so let's highlight in the book now on page 70. New Jersey has an anti-discriminatory poster, an equal housing poster as well. However, you're not automatically found guilty if it's not posted in your office, like with the federal law. Instead, you get a minimum fine of $100 for not displaying it. So let's highlight under poster, failure to display the poster is punishable by a fine of $100 or more. Then under enforcement, let's highlight the let's highlight complaints brought under the New Jersey law against discrimination must be filed at the state attorney general's office within 180 days after the alleged offense. The attorney general's office investigates. Then go to the last two lines in that same paragraph, and at the end of that next to last line, you're going to highlight fines of up to 10,000 for first, 25,000 for second, 50,000 for subsequent violations. See, I don't have you highlight everything. I just have you highlight what you need to know. (laughs) Try to streamline your notes a little bit. Okay. Um, And then the last line in that section under enforcement, the last sentence, I want you to highlight complaints brought under the New Jersey law against discrimination may be filed at any of the offices of the attorney general. Don't put your highlighters away yet. We're gonna highlight the first sentence and the last sentence under notice that listing. It basically talks about who do we gotta give the attorney general's uh, of the attorney general's memorandum to? And then what do you do if somebody tells you, you go in for a listing and they tell you that they intend to discriminate? You turn down the listing, you reject the listing. That's what that last sentence says. Salespeople and brokers must refuse listings from owners who indicate that they intend to violate the lad. All right, and then this is the poster that you see and turn the page. And this is the attorney general's memorandum on page 72, 73. Now, here are the protected classes I have on screen. I updated this from the book too. This one is probably uh, more accurate than what the book has, what you see here on screen. These are the protected classes under the LAD. Race. Creed, what is creed? That means your doctrine of religious beliefs. Color, national origin or nationality, the country you come from. Sex, gender identity or expression, marital status, civil union status, affectional or sexual orientation, familial status. This is a new one, pregnancy and breastfeeding are now listed as protected classes. Actual or perceived mental or physical disabilities. So look, if if you're not actually disabled, but somebody thinks you are, you just became a protected class. Uh, Including people with AIDS and HIV infections and COVID-19 and such. Ancestry, domestic partner status. Liability for service in the armed forces of the United States. That's a new one. 
you know, we got all these uh, very bright social justice warriors out there these days. They're against everything that's American because they, they look at our country as a bunch of tyrants. And so they're against our own military. Could you imagine discriminating against somebody who's there fighting for your freedoms to be the jackass that you're acting like, you know? <laughs> and now you're gonna discriminate against them? So they, it actually got to the point that the attorney general's office in New Jersey had to make that a protected class. Um, source of lawful income used for mortgage or rental payments. That includes uh, things like Section 8 rental housing uh, vouchers or SRAP, that's the new name for the uh, State Rental Assistance Program, or TRA. This is a very common one. TRA is Temporary Rental Assistance. It's a program where people get rental assistance from Catholic charities. Um, they're, they're a big donator uh, to help uh, poor and needy people in this state. All right. It's also illegal to place any advertisements or make any statements or utterances that express directly or indirectly any limitation to offer housing or real estate based on any of these characteristics. Okay. So these are some of the prohibited activities in New Jersey, refusing to sell rent, lease, assign. It's kind of like this, the, the federal laws too. The same, same stuff as under the federal laws, um, except there's more protected classes covered under it. A sublease as a means of discrimination for licensees refusing to offer property or to negotiate transactions as a means of discrimination or lying about the availability of a property. Um, that could all be uh, deemed discriminatory changing the terms of the real estate transaction or offering special facilities, uh, services to any person or group as a means of discrimination, being involved with any expression directly or indirectly uh, for limiting um, uh, based on limitation, placing limitations based on a protected class as a means of discrimination. Here are the exceptions to the New Jersey law against discrimination. Um, Rooms, renting rooms, apartments, or flats in certain types of housing to be restricted to members of one sex. All right. Uh, I'm going to go into that in a little bit of detail later. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to touch that right now. Uh, I'm going to get into it by having the actual conversation. When we get to the end of this chapter, we, we have a chart and we're going to go over the chart of the different types of discrimination and um, advertising. Uh, the rules on advertising and what could be construed as a discriminatory advertising and not. We're, we're going we're gonna to cover this one there. Religion, uh, religious based organizations can discriminate based on the religion. If it is an organization, not an individual, we're going to touch that in that chart. And owner occu occupants can discriminate as well because they could choose who they're living with them in their house. You know, if you're renting a room, yeah. you know, you could choose who it is that you want to live in your house with you, you know, um, except for uh, except for race. Race can't be the reason in the rental of a duplex or an over under, you know, one or two family dwelling. All right. State regulations. OK, so let me let me go now back to that attorney general's memorandum and we're gonna we're gonna look at this we're gonna study based off of this now everybody can see the attorney general's memorandum yes all right yes. so instead of reading the next and previous pages about the new jersey law against discrimination i like to actually go over the document that you're giving to people who do you give this document to owners Property owners. owners. That's right. Because look, it even says on there, two property owners. You need to know that. Who do you give this document to? All right. Now, if I ask you what document do you give to owners uh, at the time you get a listing uh, that informs them about discrimination? In the multiple choice on exams, uh, this was tricky for me. I remember when I was getting my salesperson's license and when I was studying in school, 
because I'm going back now and reviewing my notes. And when I'm reviewing my notes, I see two things listed pertaining to this in this chapter. The LAD is the New Jersey Law Against Discrimination and the Attorney General's Memorandum. And I'm looking at the definitions that I had written down and I'm like, what's the difference? They look like they do the same exact thing. Here, I'm gonna give you the, the difference because my instructor did not explain it to me. I'm gonna explain it in a simple explanation here. The LAD is the law. You don't give people the law. You give them the document that talks about the law. The attorney general memorandum is the document that informs people about the laws against discrimination. You're not giving people the law against discrimination. You're giving them the document. That document is called the attorney general's memorandum, which is what this is, okay? You don't give people the LAD, you give the, which is the law, you give them the attorney general's memorandum, which is the document that talks about the law. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. But if you just got two separate definitions of two terms and you keep studying them and they look like they're the exact same thing, you know, <laughs> that's the easier way to understand it. Okay. So hope that helps. All right. So let's see here. The New Jersey Real Estate Commission, the rec so this is the updated one. It's a little bit different than in the book. The one that's in the book was last updated 2018. You can see this one is October 7th, 2020, which is like a month after this book came out. So the New Jersey Real Estate Commission, the rec, requires every licensed broker or salesperson with whom you list your property to give you a copy of this notice. This is talking to the property owners, right? Two property owners. Uh, the purpose is to help you comply with the New Jersey law against discrimination or the LAD for short. Now, under the LAD, it's illegal to discriminate against prospective or current buyer or tenant because of actual or perceived. Um, and here's all those uh, protected classes that I just went over on that previous slide. So I'm not going to go over it again right there. Now, the LAD applies to a wide range of activities such as advertising, selling, renting, leasing, subletting, assigning, and showing property, including open land. And here's some issues that frequently come up with the LAD. Does the LAD cover uh, commercial property? Yes. Yes, all real estate. That's what the LAD covers. So, so let's go over some of these. I like the fact that they give us examples of common issues. In the past, they did not, and we had to interpret the laws for people. Remember earlier, I uh, before their lunch break, I told you about how we, um, how I had that situation with the one guy who didn't want to rent to the pregnant lady. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Because back then, the lad, I, you know, I told him to look at the, the attorney general's memorandum that his client, uh, that his uh, broker gave him uh, when he got the listing, you know. But unfortunately, back then, they did not state any examples like they do now. And on this one, they specifically talk about pregnant people, pregnant women. All right. So. The prohib Let's look at the first one here. The prohibition on discrimination based on source of lawful income means, for example, that a landlord cannot reject a prospective tenant because they intend to pay rent with Section 8 housing choice vouchers. Feedback. Um, vouchers uh, for state rental assistance programs, temporary TRA assistance, or any other subsidy or voucher uh, provided by federal, state, or local rental assistance programs. A housing provider cannot advertise a property in any way that discriminates based on a uh, source of lawful income, including by posting advertisements that state directly or indirectly a refusal to accept or express any limitation on vouchers or subsidies. So basically they can't be like, we don't accept section eight. You can't say that. Uh, so oh, actually look, they write it here. For example, advertisements that state no section eight or TRA not accepted, or this property is not approved for section eight. See, that's a, that's a little trick landlords tried to put in there. Instead of saying that uh, we don't accept section eight, they say the property is not approved for Section 8, but that's okay. Don't worry. The housing officer will send out an inspector and your property will become approved. 
<laughs> you don't have a choice in the matter, homeowner. If you want your property to be set here, here's a, here's a little thing. If you really don't want section eight tenants, you know what you do? Ask a lot of money for your rent, but you got to ask it from everybody. You can't be like, oh, you're section eight, then I'm going to charge you a higher rent. That's changing the terms or conditions for different people. And that's discriminatory. But what I meant by this is people who ask for high rents, Section 8 and these other housing voucher programs, they basically have top dollar amounts based, it's based on the county that you're in, that how much assistance that they will give for a studio, one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom, and so on. There's maximum uh, assistance that they'll give for the different units. And then they also have a, an amount if the utilities are included it's a higher amount, okay? Um, so that's the way that those assistance programs work. But you know, I tell people, why are you gonna, why are you gonna discriminate? Why don't you want section eight? Uh, that money is a direct deposit into your bank account. You don't gotta chase the tenant around for it. But you know why a lot of people, a lot of landlords, well, I don't wanna say a lot, but there's, a, there's, a, there's an amount of landlords out there that don't want section eight tenants. Why do you suppose that is? Did, did, did anybody ever hear of Section 8 before? Section 8 is just a housing yes. subsidy. Now, this comes from the county. And be, in order for a tenant to move, they need to get permission from their housing officer uh, to, um, uh, to move. Um, once they're approved for the program and they're placed in housing, before they move, they can't just decide, oh, I'm going to pick up and move. They need to get permission from their housing officer to move. So I'm bringing this up because it's important for you to know as real estate agents so that you're not wasting your time showing properties to a Section 8 uh, a renter who had not gotten the permission to move because you're just wasting your time. Also, when dealing with Section 8 tenants, if they come to us to, to look for housing, you got to ask them if they have the money to pay for our commission because Section 8 won't pay it. If they don't have the money to pay our commission, you know, don't show them the properties. Okay. I don't do it for free. It's not a charity. Right. Um, why do some landlords, though, not show Section 8 properties or Section 8 or don't want to deal with Section 8 tenants in their properties? Because of their, there's a stigma. There's a stigma about it, because the few bad apples in the program who are getting the Section Eight benefits ruin it for everybody else by putting a nasty reputation out there for people who collect these benefits. I mean, I've heard everything out there from, oh, they're all prostitutes and drug dealers, you know. And it's not the case. The majority of the people on Section 8 tenants are good people. Hell, a lot of them, it, it doesn't even mean that they're not working. It just means that they don't make a lot of money. The Section 8 subsidy, it's a subsidy to help you be able to afford a decent place to live and to have a house to live in, all right? Sometimes Section 8 benefits, the subsidy could be $25. Sometimes it'll pay the entire rent. You know, uh, interesting thing is the people who get uh, the subsidy for only like Section 8 pays only like $25 or $50 of their rent. I found that those are the people that most often don't pay it. <laughs> but, but if they're doing that, they're obligated. That's their portion of the rent. You know, they could be evicted for that. Because they didn't pay the full rent. Now, so I tell, I tell landlords, I'm just like, listen. Except Section 8 tenants, that's a guaranteed money from the government. It's direct deposit in your bank account every month. You know, uh, you don't have to worry about chasing tenants around for the money. That's a direct deposit in your bank. You know, um, if, if you're worried about the tenants being bad, well, do what you do for any tenant. You know, have have a lease and have restrictions in that lease. Have the have the ability to. Um, uh, to inspect the unit, to, if you're worried about them destroying it, have the uh, ability to say that um, the landlord, upon written notice, the landlord can inspect the unit uh, with uh, 24 or 48 hour notice. 
Okay. So basically they supply a written notice on the door that they're going to come in and inspect the unit in 48 hours within the, and for the tenant to contact them and make it available. So then the landlord comes in and inspects the unit as long as they're not harassing the tenant and doing it like every week, you know, that's, that's too much. Okay. That's, that's, that's harassment. All right. Um, so if the tenants, uh, if the tenant is violating the terms of your lease, you could evict them just like any other tenant. You treat them like everybody else. You cannot discriminate based on the source of lawful income. Okay. Lawful income. All right. The next one. Um, the lad prohibits bias-based harassment in housing. This is something new that they put in there as an example, um, including sexual harassment. If a tenant is being subject to bias-based harassment that creates a hostile environment and the housing provider knew or should have known about it, the housing provider must take reasonable steps to stop it. That includes harassment by other tenants or by the housing provider's agents or employees. A, quick, a quid pro quo sexual harassment, for example, where a building superintendent demands sexual favors or as a condition of making necessary repairs is also prohibited. You would think that that would not have to be stated, <laughs> right? But look, it, it, actually is, it actually is a problem. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of it. Ooh, yes, I got a, I got videos. I told you I got a video, right? I got videos for stuff. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you another video. <coughs> that should be my fair housing folder. It's not. All right, some of these videos I don't have downloaded. I still got to go to the website to get them, and some I do. So, mm -hmm. sorry, I got like a million videos on my computer. I'm just trying to get through them real quick. I don't know where the hell I got that video. Sorry. Um, I, I'm going to pull it up. I do have the link to it, though, but uh, I could have sworn I had this already. Oh, wait, wait, here we go. We went over this one. Woman gets harassing. I found the folder. Just give me one second so I can find the uh, the video. I know it's in here. Damn it! Maybe it's not in there. Okay, so let, let me go to the website. I'm going to show you the. Uh, we'll stream the video online. Um, I know that I have it up there. All right, just give me one second to uh, pull up that video for you. Uh, there's actually a couple of news stories I have to show you on these types of discrimination uh, that are based in New Jersey too. So let me just pull them up. Uh, fair housing discrimination, okay. Well, here's one case. That's not a video, but uh, here's a case in uh, Elizabeth. Uh, and this was just last year, August 8th. You see, this is uh, based on that radio station I told you, New Jersey 101.5. They do a lot of, oh, come on. Um, in Elizabeth, there's a, 
a guy that owns a bunch of property uh, here uh, and here's a, his address is, and I, I know somebody that lives in one of these, <laughs> one of these buildings, which is interesting. Um, so he owns a lot of these properties here in Elizabeth. Uh, I know somebody who lives in this building. Um, federal law, uh, federal authorities have filed a lawsuit accusing this, the landlord who rented low-income residents demand, demanding sex from residents on multiple occasions in exchange for assistance. The sexual harassment complaint filed by the Department of Justice in the District of Newark named uh, this guy, Joseph, whatever, Santani, who authorities said owned numerous properties in and around the Elizabeth area, uh, ranging in size from four to 100 units. He receives about $102,000 every month from the Federal Housing Choice uh, Voucher Program. It's a nice uh, income. Um, the lawsuit alleges that at least uh, that since 2005 until just last year, he engaged in severe and pervasive sexual harassment that included demanding oral sex in exchange for helping residents stay in the housing. Uh, okay, so obviously this is a violation and this does occur. This is something that's recent. This is probably why they just added this to that uh, most recent um, uh, attorney general's memorandum. You know, uh, some of these things, they get pretty graphic about explaining, so I'm not going to get into that. But uh, yeah, the guy was a uh, real slimeball. But these things, I uh, just want to show you, these things do happen. And fair housing. Society, okay. Now, let me show you the one with the renter. How about this one? Here's another one in New Jersey. One second for the video to queue up here. top story tonight a hoboken couple says their privacy was violated their bedroom security camera caught a maintenance oh, sorry i clicked that by accident maintenance worker going through their things but it's what they touched that has them still uneasy news 12 new jersey's erica such joining us in the newsroom with more on this story erica the couple tells us they purchased this security camera to just watch it out when anyone was in their apartment, but never expected to capture an employee of their building going through their underwear. Take a look. They said there was a notification for motion, so I checked it. The Rivington resident Alex Sacchetti says he was at work just a few weeks ago when his security camera in his bedroom captured moments a maintenance worker did something out of the ordinary. I started watching and the man was, you know, going towards the dresser. I was like, wow, that's strange. And then he opened it. He was going through my fiance's underwear. And, you know, after I watched the entire event, there was a lot, like potentially other lewd acts that took place, but mainly just like going through my entire apartment. The worker is seen checking the bedroom door. Close Basically what this guy is doing uh, that was caught on film if you were to watch the let me mute that for a second can you guys hear me still yes yeah okay so basically what was going on there is this guy was going through the underwear drawer and masturbating in the corner into the underwear of his uh, fiance um let's see what actually happened here losing it and turning off the lights before going into the corner of the room blocked by pillows on the camera Sacchetti says he quickly called management and alerted them that's when this moment shows the man looking at the camera when he answers his radio call to leave the unit. It was like pretty much your whole privacy is violated. Sacchetti says his fiance has been so upset by the situation, she's staying elsewhere for now. They filed a report with Hoboken police, but were told this. He had the right to be in here and apparently anything that took place is not a crime. 
The two have been back and forth with Equity Apartments, who owns the complex, but says their responses have been lacking empathy. There's been some outreach from some sort of manager or something, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but as far as oversight or, hey, so sorry this happened to you, like none of that. And while this situation still leaves him uneasy, Sacchetti says it's a warning for others. People here or elsewhere at buildings should just have some sort of surveillance to fall back on. And the couple tells us they're hoping to switch apartments in the near future. We did reach out to Equity Apartments for comment, but did not hear back. In the newsroom, America Such, News 12. See, this kind of stuff happens all over the place. Uh, we may not be paying attention to it because it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't really deal with us or our friends or family, but uh, there's these stories that they happen. Um, and so we have these federal laws in place that, uh, geez, that website is horrible, all kinds of pop-ups on it, sorry. Um, so the LAD prohibits bias based on any of those sexual harassments and uh, quid pro quo uh, in exchange for favors and stuff like that. We have to apparently now state it here, uh, which is uh, interesting that this came out around the time stories like this, the one in Elizabeth and then that one in Hoboken. They all happened uh, last year or been going on for a while, I guess. So housing providers must uh, reasonably accommodate tenants with disabilities unless doing so would be an undue burden on their operations. For example, if a tenant shows they have a disability and that keeping an emotional support animal is necessary to afford them an equal opportunity to use and enjoy the dwelling, the housing provider must permit the emotional support animal even despite a no pets policy, unless they could show that doing so would be an undue burden. That's federal law. That's not just New Jersey law, that is also federal law. So if you have a no pets rule, you cannot prevent somebody from having a service animal. All right, why? because they're not a pet. They're performing a, a necessary function as a part of the medical treatment for this person, whether it's emotional support or whether it's because they're sensing if somebody's gonna have a seizure or if they have low, low blood sugar or, or, they're, or they're a seeing eye dog or what have you, you know? Uh, so we're gonna be going over those uh, things in more detail when we get to chapter 12 that talks about um, all kinds of um, uh, rental issues. All right, so the no pets rule cannot be enforced against a person with a disability who has a service or guide animal. A landlord may not charge a tenant with a disability an extra fee for keeping a service or guide animal either. All right, so that's interesting. Let's take a look at this. I have a website pertaining to that, rental topics, service animals. Sorry, Mom. Okay. So we go back here. I found this website, the Humane Society. Uh, they have uh, uh, a, a pretty good explanation or breakdown of this. It's hard to find a good legal comprehensive argument somewhere. It's spread out all over the place. Um, so this is a pretty good explanation. So we're going to read it on this website. So the, the Federal Fair Housing Act uh, prevents discrimination against tenants and their homes. Under the FHA, a disability is defined as a physical or mental impairment, which significantly limits a person's major life activities. Even if a lease says no pets or restricted pets, landlords are required to make what is called a reasonable accommodation, like we just read on the Attorney General's memorandum. So to allow pets who serve as assistance animals, which includes animals who provide emotional support. Assistance animals are different legal classification than pets who are not assistance animals, which is why pet restrictions and fees are waived for them. 
They're animals that work. They assist or perform tasks and services for the benefit of the person with the disability or provide emotional support that improves the symptoms of the disability. There's no official certification or training for assistance animals. It's interesting, um, the arguments that you hear from people. That, that radio station, 101.5, this was another topic they had on there one time, talking about service animals. And you had all these people chiming in because there was a, uh, a thing where the airports in New Jersey uh, that service the uh, uh, tri-state area here, we have the Newark airport and some of the other airports where um, uh, operating out of New Jersey here, had came up with a new uh, service animal restriction guidelines. And people were calling furious, you know, people there know it alls. So they know everything about service animals, but they really don't know squat. They're like, oh, it's wrong. It's discriminatory that they're putting restrictions on people with disabilities from what kind of service animals they could have on the plane. So it was an interesting argument. People were getting all emotional about it, but they didn't even know what the law said or what the new rule said. So they went to the website and they pulled up the restrictions. And they said, let's, let's read this document that everybody's getting all excited about before we get too excited. Let's see what it says. What, are, what kind of restrictions are they putting in place that people are getting so angry at? And the very first line said, no, no hooved or horned animals. <laughs> well, like, a, a, like a goat? Like a goat? <laughs> like a Ram? horse? <laughs> like a pony? A bull, I don't know, hooved and horned animal. Okay, let's let's keep reading. Let's keep reading down this list. No venomous animals. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my service uh, python or, snake. Or, uh, or, <laughs> yeah, snake or whatever, a venomous snake. You know, um, I won't put it past people to try. <laughs> well, that well, the reason why they came out with this. This was around that. This story came out around that time where you guys probably saw it on the news. It was all over the place where the lady tried taking her service animal on the plane. That was a peacock. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> remember the service peacock yeah. that she wanted to take on a plane? You know, with the feathers all spread out. Yeah. You know? it's, would you like to sit next to that? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, out of the so, economy for sure. There's no restrictions in the federal law about what can be construed to be a service animal. The, the law was so broadly written by our politicians there in Washington, D.C., that, uh, that it gives the opportunity and opens up a door for people to now really try to take things to the extreme. Um, so a lot of people were calling up and saying, no, no, in order to be a service animal, it has to be a dog. No, it don't. You can have a service animal that's a dog, a cat, a bird, a ferret. It doesn't matter. It's people who have roosters that are service animals. I don't know how that works out, but whatever. So, and they- There's assist, no way to prove it. Well, the, the thing is interesting because it says that there's no certification or training required for service animals from like official sources. Because you had people calling up and they're like, no, 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 to be a service animal. I know this because I know somebody who has a service animal and they're expensive to get trained. You need to get, they need to get certified and trained. No, they don't. Look at it right here. They do not. The reason being is because the federal law says, what is, why, would you prevent an owner who knows how to train the animal themselves? That would put an undue burden and expense on the owner. So who says that the owner can't just train the animal themselves? So that's why there's no official certification or training required for assistance animals. Okay. Um, breed and weight restrictions do not apply to assistance or service animals. Hmm. Not a lot of people don't want people to have them pit bulls. No. What if it's a service animal? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 
one thing I would advise people to talk uh, to a lawyer about, though, there are some municipalities in the state that have restrictions on certain breeds of animals that they just don't want in them. They're, they're banned from the municipality. OK, so if that like if you have a service animal that's a pit bull, but a pit bull is banned from that municipality, um, then uh, consult your attorney. Uh, I'm not giving any legal advice. Here. <laughs> OK. All right, so here's some differences. What's the difference between a service animal and an assistance animal? A lot of times people throw out these terms and they think it means the same thing. No, they don't. No, they don't. Service animals are categorized as animals trained to perform a specific task for their owner. And the most common example is a guide dog for blind people. But service animals are allowed in public accommodations because of the owner's need to have that animal at all times. Mm -hmm. They could take them on the beach. They could take them in a restaurant. An assistant animal can be a cat, a dog, or any type of companion animal. You know what's interesting about this? We get so many people who say they got service animals and they genuinely believe that they do because they went to some website where they got their pet certified as a service animal. And look, you can look them up in a database and it shows that they're a cer certified service animal. And look, they even send you a, a license for the animal and, the, and the, the, the harness where you can put the license and it all looks so legit. It's all bullshit. It's fake. Those websites are fake. You went to a website to have your animal registered as a service animal. It's fake. First of all, service animals do not need to be registered. And searchable in a database, if you have a service animal, I would think that HIPAA laws would prevent that from happening. You guys ever hear of that? HIPAA? You know, yes. your medical privacy laws for medical mm -hmm. records right that that right there should be your first clue that it's a scam right um what is required for you to have a service animal is that you need a prescription from a doctor that needs to be renewed regularly all right that's it does the person with a disability have to have a card that shows that the, that that's a service animal no too restrictive does the, does the animal have to have a license number or card on them? No, too restrictive. All right, so the emotional or physical benefits of the animal living in the home are what qualify it as being a service animal. A letter from a medical doctor or therapist is all that's needed to classify the animal as an assistance animal. Look, some people could be sick uh, it could be um, not necessarily that they're blind or low blood sugar or seizures. It could be PTSD or something like that. They're, they're helping calm the person, you know? Um, the fact that the service animal is often used by a landlord and public housing authorities to refer both service dogs and service animals is what creates the confusion. Look, here's some examples of service animals. A cat who can detect... Uh, seizures that are oncoming. I, I really never thought cats were that bright. So look at that. You learn something new every day. Um, a dog who alleviates a person's depression or anxiety or a cat who reduces a person's stress induced pain or a bird who alerts somebody who's hard of hearing that there's someone at the door. That's interesting. They do high pitch squeals. You know, I never thought of that one. Right. Um, so how do you demonstrate that your pet is an assistance animal? Well, you should provide the landlord with a letter from your doctor stating that you have a need, okay? Not one of those letters from some website that says that we certified them as a service animal. You need something on a doctor's letterhead. That's what the airlines require. Now, do you have to prove that you have a that they are a service animal for the airlines? Yes. If it's a, if you're ordering those tickets with more than 24 hours note uh, in advance, then you need to, and you're having a service animal on the plane, you need to also provide medical uh, no, uh, document showing that it is a service animal. If it's, um, so if we're renting property and somebody says they got a service animal, do we got to allow them to uh, bring their, their animal, their service animal? Renting, yes. Yeah. How do you know? How do you know it's a service animal? 
and it's not somebody who thinks that they legitimately have a service animal because they paid a lot of fees online to some website who said that they were going to register your animal as a service animal. Basically, you have a fake service animal and you don't even know it. But if it, a service animal is something like a, a, a dog for a blind person, correct? That's not an assistant. Yeah. So well, you said service animal. Either service or assistance animal. Well, at least with a service animal, you can show the doctor's note that you need it, correct? Well, that's the thing. For either one, you would. <clears throat> oh, you would need it. You, you have to get a doctor's note for the assistance also? Yeah. Service or assistance animals perform oh, okay. functions. And then you have the, um, let's see, service and assistance animals. Okay, so uh, the assistance, let's see, service animals perform a function, assistance animals, they could just be there that you pet them. You know, they don't, they're not trained to do anything. You pet them and they calm you, you know. Um, but either one of them, you need a letter from a doctor showing that you have the need for them, the med a medical need for them. Otherwise, it's a pet. Right? If you don't have a medical need, it's a pet. Okay. So a no pets rule would apply. But if you uh, if you have a service or assistance animals, you're allowed, uh, the landlord is supposed to allow you to provide reasonable accommodations. Okay. So if your landlord refuses to accommodate, a landlord must agree a reasonable accommodation request if the, dis if the disability claim is true. And if the uh, request does not create a hardship on the landlord or other tenants in some way. Um, I've seen this come up before where the landlord said that they're allergic and they live in the same building, you know. Um, That's a good one. But you really gotta, I, I would say before you use that as your reason and try to do that yourself if you're a landlord, I, I would say talk to an attorney that specializes in this stuff because otherwise you could get hit hard with discrimination. Because you're not in the same apartment as them. I know that's what I would think too, but sometimes people try to use that as an excuse. You know, you're not in the same apartment as them. So how is the animal going to be uh, affecting you? You know. Yeah. Um, so let's see. If your request for a reasonable accommodation is denied by the landlord, you have the right to request that a governmental agency investigate the claim. Who would investigate that in New Jersey? Well, if you file it, if you file it. Uh, According to HUD, uh, for the federal law, it would be with HUD. If you file it as a violation of the New Jersey law, you'd file it with the Attorney General. Attorney General. The Attorney General's office, right? Yeah. All right. Okay. So you have several options for filing those complaints online, housing, pet fees. Okay. So here's the exception. All types of housing, including public housing, are covered by the federal, uh, the, the Fair Housing Act. So with the exception of rental dwellings of four or less units, where one unit is occupied by the owner, they don't have to allow your service animal. Single family homes sold or rented by the owner without the use of a broker. Housing owned by private clubs or religious organizations that restrict occupancy of housing units to their members. And then can they charge pet fees for service animals? No, because they're not pets. They're service animals. Service or assistance animals are not technically pets and owners do not have to pay pet fees. The landlord, however, can charge a security deposit and may still seek money from the tenant if there's any damages caused by the animal in the home. Also, if there's a nuisance issue, you can't keep your animal under control or your service animal. The landlord does have the right to try to remove the assistance animal through legal proceedings. Okay. So can you kick a can you kick a service animal out of a restaurant or deny somebody entry into a restaurant that has a service nope. animal? No. Nope. We just read that you could. If that animal's out of control, they cannot keep that animal in control. That animal's nipping at people, barking, lifting its leg and urinating all over the place. They absolutely can ask you to leave. 
under those are those are the only situations where that would happen now. Okay. Um, same thing with housing is basically what they were getting at. All right, so we went over those no pet rules thing here. All right, now landlords must permit a tenant with a disability at the tenant's own expense. So tenants with disabilities, the landlord must permit the tenant at their own expense to make reasonable modifications to the premises if such modifications are needed to give the tenant equal opportunity to enjoy the dwelling unit. So can the landlord deny a person with a disability um, to modify, make modifications to that home? No, but they have to pay for it then? It is their, uh, at their expense, correct. Landlord has to allow it as long as it's reasonable, you know, and it's needed by them. Uh, then, um, then, then they have to allow it, but at the land, but at the uh, tenant's expense. So putting in a ramp or something to that nature. Now this, or, or make putting in a wider door to accommodate a wheelchair. Now, when the tenant leaves, uh, do, do they got to put it back the way the property was? No. No. Yes. Some What's of it's permanent, no? You said it's no? So it was part of the um, the real estate. It's part of the house then? Um, if they make modifications, uh, the, can, the question is, can the landlord require the tenant to put the property back the way it was before they modified it? Okay. Oh, if they're renting, yeah. Because they have to allow for them to modify so they could uh, fully enjoy the premises, but uh, can they require them to put it back the way that it was? I'm, I don't know. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. It depends. I'd say, yeah. It depends. <laughs> it depends. Because if, if it's permanent, it's like ramp, if they need a wider door, you can't really put that back to like the way the door was before. Oh, sure you could. But uh, but, but, but the, the question would, base on, would be based on this. Would having and leaving that modification there cause a problem for a future tenant to be able to fully enjoy the premises? Right. Got it. Okay. Right. If if the a wider door, I'm sure future tenants would appreciate that for moving their yeah. furniture in and out. Yeah. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah. But the ramp, yeah, they could require them to remove a ramp. But most likely that they're going to take that ramp with them if they're those steel ramps. Those steel ramps are expensive. Those things are thousands of dollars. But if they built their own wooden ramp there or something, yeah, they could ask them to remove it. Right? Uh, let's see. The LAD prohibits discrimination on familial status. For example, discrimination against uh, families with children under 18 and pregnant women. Landlords similarly cannot use reasonable occupancy restrictions to prevent families with children from moving in like that guy did for me and my clients, or he was attempting to do anyway. Remember that? So um, I wish it was stated on the lad back then, but it wasn't. Now it is. So that's a good thing for you guys. Um, you, know, you know that they used to have, uh, oops, it's this one. You know that they say here, landlords similarly cannot use uh, unreasonable occupancy restrictions to prevent families from uh, moving in. You know, previously there used to be a restriction um, in New Jersey that said that um, if you have two children and there were of uh, different sex, different gender, they could not occupy the same bedroom. Really? Yeah. It was... Um, it's the thought of some sick minds out there thinking that they're going to be having sex with each other or something. What was that, the 30s or something, 30s or 40s? Well, actually it was only removed several years back before I, just before I got into business, uh, but it, it was still pretty recent. But hey, <laughs> don't, 
don't just dismiss laws and weird laws. Just do a Google search for strange laws in New Jersey or, or strange laws in the United States, in different states. You're going to see some wacky stuff. You think New Jersey's got it covered and we're protecting everybody? What do our politicians do in New Jersey? Um, a couple years ago, uh, the politicians in New Jersey, well, a couple of years, it's quite a few years back now, but uh, a couple of years back in New Jersey, uh, not, not, we're not talking like 20, 30 years ago either. This is not that long ago. Um, New Jersey, it used to be illegal in New Jersey, but they took the law off the books. They removed the law that made, that made incest illegal. <laughs> That's having sex with your children, your blood children, your blood relatives. So much to the point that you could look this up. There was a news story that I found where a guy moved back to New Jersey when they took those laws off the books so that he could marry his daughter. Whoa. I want to throw up now. That's sick. <laughs> the world is a crazy place. <laughs> sure Welcome is. to New Jersey. Yeah. Wow. That's not the world. That's New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at the politicians, you know, and then, and then you're shocked when you see Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> Guy was providing a service to the bunch of pervs that, uh, that are out there in Hollywood and uh, D.C., right? All right, so let's see. <laughs> Some weird, weird, weird laws out there. There are. There are a lot of... Like an, there's like a Trenton one that is like illegal to eat a pickle on a Sunday or something like that that I read. <laughs> <laughs> They got some weird laws. They got some weird <laughs> laws in, municip in different municipalities. You know, oh, you want to find something entertaining? Look up a look up a website called uh, Weird New Jersey WeirdNJ.com, and they also have a Facebook page WeirdNJ.com. I think I have links to it. Yeah, they they talk about the tales about the Jersey Devil and yeah. how that came about, and all kinds of uh, the grave that's in the middle of a shopping center parking lot. Yeah, the devil's tree and all that stuff. <laughs> and all that stuff is locally here too. That, that the grave in the parking lot, that's uh that's on Route 18. Oh really? Yeah, East Brunswick. Okay. It's North Brunswick or East Brunswick. Oh, I live right by there. I should go to find it. <laughs> Take a look, it's interesting. All right. The um the lad okay, so let's see. Ch -ch -ch selectively inquiring about or requesting information about the documentation of a prospective tenant or buyer's immigration or citizen status. See, this is probably why these last couple ones are probably why they updated this really quick here in 2020, um, because we became a sanctuary state. So uh, they added in here that uh, selectively inquiring about people's uh, documentation about being uh, citizens, uh, immigration or citizen status uh, because of their actual or perceived national origin, race, ethnicity, or otherwise discrimination based on the violation of the LAD. So they can't outright say that it's illegal for you not to rent to somebody who's not here legally. Because how do you write a law that says it's illegal to discriminate against somebody who is breaking the law, right? So instead they word it this way. You can't discriminate against people because of the way they look and you're going to assume that they're from a different country. That's what this is saying. See, based on their status because of the person's actual perceived national origin, race, ethnicity, or otherwise discriminating, all right? Um, crafty little ways they, they craft these laws. Okay, this next one is a little bit uh, mind bending. Um, once again, it, it has some uh, political correctness mixed in with current, you know, with current events, mixed in with uh, a legitimate argument. Um, I'll break it down for you. 
As explained in the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development's April 2016 guidance document, because of widespread racial and, dis uh, and ethnic disparities in criminal justice system, blanket policies that make all individuals with any prior arrest or criminal convictions ineligible to rent violate fair housing laws because they have a disproportionate impact based on race or national origin and are not supported by legitimate uh, business necessity. Wait, what? Are they saying that you have to rent to somebody? You can't check to see if they're a convicted criminal? Don't we have background checks that we could do for yeah. this? Mm -hmm. Yes. But now they're trying to turn it into a racial disparity, criminal justice type argument. All right. That, that, yeah. first, that first part sounds really out there to me. But let's look at the other part. Which is uh, which is a little bit more legitimate. Uh, let's see, and the housing providers may not use discriminate uh, criminal history as a pretext for intentionally discriminating. Now they say based on race or national origin. Okay, well those are two different things. We already cannot discriminate based on race or national origin, right? Now they're saying, well, you can't check somebody's criminal history because they're of one race and then not check another tenant's criminal history because they're of another. That I understand because that's setting two different standards for different people. I understand that one. I get what they're getting at there. Um, if you're going to do a background check for criminal, uh, criminal behavior, you should do it for everybody. Everybody. You should not apply that same criminal record based restriction against a black person uh, housing applicants, but not for white persons in uh, housing applicants, you know, so that I understand, you know, and we do background checks on everybody. Okay, not we don't do it based on if you look like you're a foreigner, if you look like you're black or Hispanic versus white, you know, we do background checks on everybody, if the tenant wants them, if the landlord wants them. All right, so penalties. If you commit a, a discriminatory uh, housing practice that violates the LAD, what are the fines? 10, 25, 50,000, right? You guys gotta know that for exam, but it says it right here on the Attorney General's memorandum. Mm -hmm. Victims of discrimination may recover economic damages related to discrimination, such as having to pay for a higher rent for another unit because you didn't lease them the unit based on discriminatory reasons. That, that person who discriminated may be required to pay the difference in rent, the higher rent that the tenant has to pay, as well as damages for emotional distress, pain, and humiliation. In more egregious cases, a victim may also recover punitive damages. Now, this is a note about us to the homeowner. Brokers, the broker or salesperson with whom you list your property must transmit to you every written offer they receive on your property. How soon? 24 hours. 24 hours. Brokers and salespeople are licensed by the New Jersey Real Estate Commission and their activities are subject to the LAD as well as the, gen as well as the general real estate laws of the state. What are the general real estate laws of the state also known as? Title, 45. Title 45, 15. Title 45, chapter 15, correct. And the commission's own rules and regulations, which we call? 11-5. Title 11, <laughs> chapter five, or? the administrative code. Administrative right? code. So the broker and salesperson must refuse your listing if you indicate an intent to discriminate uh, on any basis prohibited by the LAD. Here are some exemptions. The sale of a property, whether uh, including open land, whether it's for business or residential purposes covered by the LAD. So there you go, all real estate is covered by the LAD. Uh, subject to the following exceptions. Note, when the LAD exception applies, other civil rights laws may nonetheless prohibit the discrimination. Once again, that, that's the saying that I told you. When two laws cover the same topic, the more restrictive law will always prevail, right? The more restrictive rule will always prevail. So the LAD does not apply to rental of one unit in a, or uh, one unit in a two family dwelling if the owner occupies the other or if uh, the rental of rooms or rooms is in a one family owner occupied dwelling. 
a religious organization can give preference to the people of the same religion. That's an organization, not a religious person. That's a religious organization. You can't say, well, I'm not going to rent to a person because of their religion. Um, a religious organization can say that if they own housing, that they're going to only rent to people of the same religion. That's, that's a little bit different. In certain types of housing designated for older persons, it's not unlawful to discriminate based on familial status. But remember, you need to have that, that HUD form <coughs> saying that you're certified as a um, housing for older persons, uh, six seniors or 55 plus community, right? All right, and that's it. Now, one thing you notice, there's no signature line anywhere on this, right? No, there isn't. All right. So you should give one copy of this to the uh, owner and have them initial or sign their name like here in this blank white spot over here, this open space or at the end of the form. You got all this empty space down here. And then you keep that other part that you put in your transaction folder with your listing to prove that you've given it to them. We're not required to have them sign it, but remember, I always say CYA, have a paper trail, right? So give them the disclosure and have them sign another. So they can't say they never seen it. You'll be like, boop, your signature's on it, right? I have a question. As, as you worked in real estate, was there a checklist you made for yourself saying like, every time I'm working with the client, steps from one through 20, this is the order I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna make sure they sign these papers, that's done. Step two, or we do this, three, do you do it like that? Uh, it's not a bad idea, but um, uh, no two properties are alike. So you have a lot of different things that would not necessarily apply to every transaction. Okay. But if you wanted to, you could make a list of all of the documents and disclosures and stuff. And then as you work with the client, you know, you could go through things that you want to explain to them, for example, you know, say, don't forget to go over this. Don't forget to go over that. Don't forget to explain this. Don't forget to explain that to buyers for sellers. Don't forget to go ask them this or ask them that or go over this or go over that. Give them these forms. Blah, blah, blah. And then you could have a column that checks off done or does not apply you know, to your transaction. It's okay. not a bad idea to do, um, but that would vary from one person to the other, you know. As far as the forms go, in last chapter two, I had a, I had one thing that showed you, you got the CIS forms, first document you give to anybody to disclose your agency relationship. You have the informed consent to dual agency when you're acting as a dual agent that they need to sign. You have the attorney general's memorandum that you give to the owner at the time you get a listing telling them about discrimination, which is this document that we just went over. Um, you have the, um, you have the uh, opinion 26 notice that needs to be the cover page of any contract prepared by licensees that, I, that tells them um, that they have the right to hire a lawyer, right? They have a right to have an attorney. Um, we have the lead paint addendum. Uh, this is a, uh, a document that's required by federal law anytime a property was built prior to 1978. It needs to be given to, well, everybody in the transaction, but it needs to be filled out by the homeowner first, and then the, the, the other part needs to be filled out by the buyer or renter, okay? Uh, if the house was built prior to 1978. Um, those are pretty much, those are pretty much the, uh, the disclosures that we got. Uh, I mean, we got more disclosures for other things, but those are the more common ones that we use all the time. Okay. Okay. So it's not a really long, exhaustive list, you know? Yeah. And after you do one or two transactions, you're going to know it. I mean, you know it off the top of your head. You're not going to, you're not going to need a list anymore, you know? Got you. Okay. So you probably waste a lot of time preparing a list instead of actually just doing it. And then when you do it, you'll know it. You do it a couple of times, you'll know it, you know? So trust me, I was a list maker. <laughs> you, you waste more time preparing these lists, you know, than, uh, than actually doing work and getting anything done. Focus on, uh, focus on doing the job, okay? You learn, okay. you'll learn. All right.
So, where it says multiple dwelling reporting, state regulations uh, on rentals, uh, source of income, children and family, other provisions. Okay, multiple dwelling reporting. This is on page 75. An apartment building with 25 units or more must report annually to the state the racial composition of their tenants and the methods used to advertise and handle rental inquiries. Why? Well, the purpose is to monitor possible discrimination if no minorities live there. How exactly were you advertising to get tenants? Okay, but that's only if you're dealing with uh, buildings with 25 or more units, okay? Um, okay, zoning discrimination, we're gonna highlight this. This will absolutely be on both exams. Highlight zoning discrimination, Mount Laurel one and two. And, um, Just study from this slide. We'll read this. I'll explain to you the law, how it came about, what it's about, and the two sides of the story. Okay, this is an interesting one. And I'm gonna give you a little information that could uh, possibly help you out if you're involved in any real estate development or if you got clients that are, um, you'll find this, uh, these tips quite interesting. Um, it just shows you that when news is reported about things, you gotta take it with a grain of salt. Who's reporting it? How are they slanting that news, you know? Same thing when it comes to how people are writing in this book, for example. Let's, let's read, in 1971, a lawsuit came about that was known as the Mount Laurel One decision. It was filed by the NAACP against the town of Mount Laurel, New Jersey for illegal discrimination against low income and moderate income persons through the use of something that came to be known as exclusionary zoning. So I highlight that term exclusionary zoning. Now the court stated that all developing communities had to zone for their fair share of the regional need for low income and moderate income families. In 1975, the court ruled that the poor may not be excluded from residential areas. How do you suppose they were excluding people from residential areas? The way the book makes it sound, it makes it sound kind of like they made zoning laws based on your income that you can't live in certain areas. No, that's not the case though. But people were discriminated against. And I'm gonna give the town of Mount Laurel the, the benefit of the, uh, of the argument here. And let's just say that it wasn't done intentionally. Um, but nonetheless, people were still discriminated against. Well, how were they kept out of these areas? This is the way it works. I read up on this before I teach anything, I try to do as much research on it as I can. So I get questions, oh. from you guys. So there was, uh, there was one article I was reading about all about this stuff. New Jersey's an old state. We were, what are we, the third state in the nation that was created? And um, we got a lot of history. Uh, remember we had a civil war. We had slavery days in this country. And you guys remember something called the Underground Railroad? This is where, yeah. this is where people escaped from the South to be free in the North right? Because the South still had slavery, the North didn't, right? So uh, the, the town of Mount Laurel, New Jersey was one of those settling points for a lot of uh, slaves that were smuggled into New Jersey uh, uh, through the Underground Railroad. And um, so you have a long line of family descendants of people who have uh, been living there for a long time. Now, when people 
been living there, they just, you know, they passed the houses down to people through the generations, to their family members. However, a lot of these houses from way back when are older and they were built right on top of each other. There's this, there's this one road I've seen the picture of uh, that you got houses that are literally one right on top of the other all the way down the street. Now the town of Mount Laurel, New Jersey wanted to, to be able to improve their, their, their school systems, their roads, the policing and all that. How does a town get the money to do that? Where do they get the money from to pay for services for the city? Taxes. 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 What are taxes based on? How, how much you pay in taxes is based on what? Income. Um, no, no, property taxes. The size of your lot, property value. The value of the property. Now, let me ask you a question. Is a larger lot worth more than a smaller lot? Could yeah. be. Probably. Depending yeah. where it is. Yeah, probably. Right? Uh, well, in the same area. Okay. Larger lot worth yeah. more than a smaller? Yeah. 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 Okay. So the town of Mount Laurel, New Jersey came up with a good idea. They just put it into effect poorly. They executed it poorly. What they did is they said, wait, we got a, we got a great idea on how we could generate more tax money. Now, we, we can't do this by changing anything for people that already live there, okay? They have their houses there. We can't require them to have a larger lot. Now, those houses are grandfathered. But anybody else who wants to build a house in town is going to need a larger lot size. So they change their zoning laws to require a larger lot size in order to build a house. So houses are not built right on top of each other. And in effect, you're going to be increasing the property values, too. Does that sound like a good plan? Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a good plan to me. However... The way they went about executing it was kind of bad. What was the minimum lot size? They made it very large. Uh, I'm not sure what the exact size of it was. So we're going to go with a made up number just for our conversation. Let's just say they required you to have at least one acre of land to build a house. That's a lot of land in New Jersey, right? To have an acre of land to build a house on. So wait a minute. By requiring so much land, are you effectively pricing poor people out of the community from being able to buy a property there and build a house on it? Yeah. They may not be able to afford one acre of land. So that's how they came about phrasing it this way, that poor people were discriminated against from uh, living in the area because of the zoning law. Okay. Uh -huh. They made it sound like it's based on your income. It's not based on your income, but this is eventually, this is how it was based on discriminating against poor people because they couldn't afford the larger lot to live in the town. And now when you require a larger lot like that, people with huge lots like that are gonna build bigger houses too. And they started building mansions. And now when they build mansions in the area, the value of the raw land goes up even more. So you're effectively pricing people out. So that's how that lawsuit came about because the town of Mount Laurel didn't require like a, a reasonable larger lot size. They required a huge lot size and they didn't even allow like in certain areas of town to have smaller lot sizes. They required the large lot size everywhere. So that's how they, that's how this lawsuit came about. And the first lawsuit is a good lawsuit because they did go about implementing it in a bad way. It was a good idea that was implemented in a wrong way. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that they, they weren't meaning to price poor people out of the area, uh, that they were just trying to generate the income to improve the town. I'm going to go with that and assume that their intention is not ill will. So let's just look at it that way. So um, now in 1983, a second lawsuit came about called uh, filed by the NAACP against Mount Laurel, New Jersey, that resulted in the courts uh, providing specific guidelines for all developing communities. Wait a minute. 
That's not true. Courts did not provide specific guidelines. Courts required municipalities to create their own specific guidelines on how they were going to go about providing a range of housing for people in the community. All right, so that's a little bit of a trip up there with those words. Um, so it resulted in the courts providing specific guidelines or requiring municipalities to create their own specific guidelines in developing communities that said that all municipalities have an obligation to provide their fair share of housing, uh, to provide a range of housing. Uh, this was accomplished by allowing for higher density developments. That means to be able to build homes closer together than normally allowed. Or a, and a 20% set aside. What is a set aside? Would you think? What would you guess is a set aside? Why do they use such cryptic wording? Set aside. I would assume, let's go with this definition that I'm going to assume that that means for every 100 homes built, 20 have to be for low and affordable house, low income and affordable housing. Okay, let's go with that because that seems like what the whole gist of everything's about. Okay. Um, and zoning for mobile homes and a requirement that communities must cooperate with the efforts to obtain subsidies. What are subsidies? It's like a bad word, government, right? Money, <laughs> right? Um, now, when you create a law now that requires municipalities to get money, hmm, could corruption be following it? <laughs> yeah, most likely. I mean, follow the money, you find the, you find the crooks, right? Um, a, a panel of three judges was appointed by the chief justice to set up that uh, was set up to handle listening to cases uh, where people experience hardships by the create uh, by these uh, towns that have restrictive guidelines. So, Mount Laurel one one decision was a good decision. It said that the municipality had to provide uh, a range of lot sizes. They couldn't just say you had to have this monstrous lot size in order to build a house. So the zoning had to vary to accommodate for poorer people as well, right? Mount Laurel two decisions said, Mount Laurel two decisions said that um, in addition to that, they also had to try to get money for government subsidies. They had to keep track of, of all the new construction that was being built, they had to keep track of the numbers because the town had an obligation to, to uh, for a 20% set aside that homes had to be available for uh, low and moderate income persons, right? Does it say where it needs to be built? Nope. nope. Because the court said they left it up to the communities themselves to create their own specific guidelines. The courts did not create specific guidelines. They left it up to the communities to create their own specific guidelines. And if you leave it to a municipality, if you order a municipality to create their own rules that they have to follow, a lot of the municipalities were like, we're, we're not doing it. If you're not gonna give us some sort of a framework that we have to create rules on. We're not going to create all these restrictions on ourselves that we could then be found guilty of, right? So majority of municipalities in New Jersey do not have a written plan of how they're going to go about building these 20% set-asides. They, they're keeping track of the numbers and they may be even building them, but they don't have a written guideline about how they're going to go about building and they're collecting the money from state and federal government to subsidize the low and affordable income housing. Now, do they say where that housing needs to be built? No, they don't. So you're getting a lot of municipalities that may be doing stuff like this. They're getting the money from the state and federal government and the subsidies. And then they're going to neighboring towns like, oh, say Newark. And they're giving them the money to take on their obligation of building the affordable housing. It's not even getting built in the town. Mm. I got it. Because of this, the last statement here at the bottom said a panel of judges was appointed. And, and it doesn't really say a whole lot there about what they're supposed to be doing. Check out the slide that I prepared for you. 
here's what you need to know for exam. And here's in real life, the stuff that deals with this. Um, there's a lawsuit came about that's called Builder's Remedy. If you want to build a house in one of these communities that did not create a written plan about how they're going to address building that low income and affordable housing, you can sue the municipality before these uh, judges, this panel of judges that's set up to listen to these cases. The lawsuit is called Builder's Remedy. And anyone who's been disadvantaged by the local zoning laws, who was basically denied building because that's not zoned for what you want to build there. All they got to do is look up and see if that town doesn't have the written plan for how they're going to address the Mount Laurel decisions, uh, court decision stuff. They could sue the city and then ignore their city zoning laws and build whatever the hell they want. Check this out. Wasn't that purpose to be for low income housing though? Low income and affordable housing? Yeah. Yeah. But check this out. If you sue for builder's remedy, a lot, this is a builder's trick that they're doing now. It's a loophole in the law. You get a lot of builders that want to build something that has no low or low income or affordable housing in it whatsoever. There, it's just a, a way of them getting around the local zoning laws to be able to build whatever the hell they want. Tricky, tricky. Mm. Now, because of that, a couple of years back, this was around the time when um, Governor Christie was uh, uh, around the time where he announced that he's going to be running for president. You guys remember that? Around that period of time, um, politics is very contentious. He's still acting as the governor of New Jersey. So he went to the politicians in the state because politicians make the laws. The governor doesn't make the laws. The governor just signs off on them after our legislators make the law, right? That's the way we make laws in the United States. The legislator, uh, legislative body creates the law. They propose it. They hash out the wording of it and all that. And then when they agree on everything, they go. it moves up the ladder to the governor to sign it into law. Well, the governor went because he can't make law, he went to our legislative bodies and he said, guys, these Mount Laurel decision laws are broken. They're full of loopholes. The affordable and low income housing that's meant to be built by these laws is not getting built. People are using it as a loophole. Um, so I want you guys to sit down and do away with this law and write a new law from scratch without the loopholes in it. Ooh, the rain. You guys recall what uh, what was in the news after that, after he said that to the legislative body? All you heard in the national news, New Jersey news and national news, was that Governor Christie was trying to do away with laws and protections for minority persons and poor people. Wow. That somebody's got some real rain going down there. All right, so I know I, I got it too. So that's what you hear in the public eye. But in the meantime, what was he trying to do? He was actually just trying to get them to fix the law. This is why politics is so broken. We can't get anything done because one party is against the other party, no matter what. Even if they're trying to do something good, they 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 just attack them and pounce all over them immediately. Um, and it's important for us as real estate agents to be aware of how politics affects real estate. I don't care what your political beliefs are on anything, guys, but you need to be aware. You need to be a realist if you're going to be in this business. You need to be aware of the facts and how polit political issues affect us. And it, it, could it could affect us in everything from zoning and construction to the school systems, which affect taxes, to... Um, uh, permits to, to build a house or sell a house, inspections that are required. Um, there's, that's why the Realtors Organization has their own legislative body. And if you guys go to New Jersey Realtor, um, 
you could probably see, I think it's NewJerseyRealtor.com. Let me see. And, or is it NJ Realtor? It's NJRealtor.com. This is the New Jersey Realtors website. You could see governmental affairs and stuff, research and issues. Somewhere on this site, they show all the good things that uh, realtors, uh, realtors have done to prevent bad laws that would affect um, negatively affect renters and homeowners. So um, we, we, we do a lot of good things for the public too, that the public's un maybe unaware of. But so here's the, here's another link for you guys to put into your uh, repertoire of links there. Uh, NJRealtor.com. That's the state website. You guys are going to become members of this. You're going to join a local association, which is going to also sign you up for the state association, which is going to sign you up for national. Oh, what's this? Brand new member benefit. Introducing the legal resource library. Hmm. What is that about? Oh, yeah. Check this out. We have this new benefit on this website, too. If you guys have any questions about something, if it's legal and that you could do it, you could search in here for it and they give you answers. Look, these are a lot of questions that real estate agents ask, like uh, required information. What's required information that has to be put on business cards? You know, and then you could view the response. They have a legal team that goes over everything and they give you the answers and they quote the laws and rules and regulations. It's really neat. Okay. So what do we need to know for exams for Mount Laurel? Mount Laurel one and two decisions. Uh, it's, a, it's a law that made exclusionary zoning, uh, which is a discriminatory zoning practice. It was outlawed by the Mount Laurel court decisions, which discriminated against low income persons, the poor. It said you cannot discriminate against the poor. Lower income individuals may not be excluded from residential areas and municipalities have an obligation to provide a range of housing. That's the formal answers and stuff you need to study for exams. I did tell you I was giving you a tip though. This builder's remedy, how could you use it? Anybody here familiar with Cranford? Cranford, New Jersey, Cranford train station? Well, across, yeah, across the street from the Cranford train station, it was all single family homes. Um, somebody went up and they bought up all those single family homes on the block. They bought them all, a developer. He wanted to tear them all down and put storefronts with apartments or condos above them and build like, you know, because they were all single family houses there. So maybe one or two story buildings. Now he wants to put these things that are like four or five story buildings up there with stores underneath them, you know? And this, the town of Cranford said, you can't do that. That's only zoned for single family residential properties. So the developer, they obviously did their research in advance and saw that the town of Cranford did not have a written plan according to the Mount Laurel decisions of how they were gonna address that affordable housing issue. So they took the town of Cranford to court and sued them over that, the fact that the town's zoning laws were not allowing them to build what they wanted to, even though it was not affordable housing that they were trying to build. Um, they, that they were not allowed to build what they wanted to because of zoning laws and that the town did not create a written plan to deal with the Mount Laurel issue. So the courts told them, Okay, well then we're gonna grant you the permission. You could build whatever you want. You could ignore the city's zoning laws. And now they built across the street from Cranford train station, these stores with expensive housing above it. None of it's for poor or affordable. They used a loophole that's meant to protect poor people and affordable housing to build something just to ignore the zoning laws. This is exactly what Governor Christie was trying to get them to fix. So it's interesting. But the, don't they need to prove that they have people who are low income and living in there at least 
No, obviously not. Look, look, don't trust me. Don't, don't trust me on a word I say. Do a Google search for, new, for the words New Jersey and builders remedy lawsuits. You're gonna see a lot of towns that don't have the written plan of, mm -hmm. for the Mount Laurel where lawsuits are like this and builders are doing this stuff all the time. It's a loophole. So if you guys are gonna get involved in construction at all and you're and the town rejects you and they say that you can't build what you wanna build because it's, it doesn't uh, conform to the zoning laws, try to look up and see if they have a written plan of how they're gonna deal with the Mount Laurel issues in that town. If they don't, take them to court with a lawsuit called Builder's Remedy. Builder's Remedy is nowhere in this book. I'm teaching you that guys. OK, this is a little gem I'm giving you. So you don't need to be a rich guy to be able to know how to work the system. You just need to know the rules. And here's a rule. And who made these rules? The politicians. They built these loopholes in there. Why aren't they fixing them? Well, because they're probably getting paid and skimmed off money from that subsidies. And I'm sure many of them are dealing in real estate and construction, and they're using these loopholes to their advantage as well. Hmm, interesting okay it, it is but that's this is the stuff that you never hear and you'll never hear in the news right but look up builders lawsuit you could do your own research and confirm what i said to you okay i got nothing to hide all right but this is what you need to know for exams it is absolutely on exams a discriminatory zoning practice um at, at a an outlawed discriminatory uh zoning law or zoning practice, exclusionary zoning. Who was excluded? The poor. What, what law made it illegal? Mount Laurel decisions. So basically this first statement, you could just study that. I, I spent a bit of time on it because I want to give you tips, but I also wanted to explain to you real life and what is portrayed as and then how you could use it to your advantage. Why not? And what you need to know for exam. All right, so moving along. So code for equal opportunity. Turn the page, page 76, where it says implications for brokers and salespersons. I want you to highlight the last line in the first paragraph there. The complainant does not have to prove guilty knowledge or specific intent, only the fact that discrimination occurred. Remember I told you it's a low threshold to be found guilty of discrimination. It, doesn't, it didn't have to be your intent to discriminate. You were trying to help somebody. But if they could prove that a discriminatory act had occurred, boom, you're guilty of discrimination. That's all they got to prove. Your intent is irrelevant. And look, it says it right there. All right, so what do you do if you have somebody that's looking for housing and um, they're basing it off of, uh, how do they word it here? If a prospect, uh, this is one, two, three, the fourth paragraph down. If a prospect expresses a locational preference for housing based on race, the association's guidelines suggest the following response. I cannot give you that kind of advice. I'll show you several homes that meet your specifications and you will have to decide which ones you want, okay? Sounds a little robotic, don't it? <laughs> so you guys are gonna have to try to learn how to uh, answer questions for people when they, uh, if they ask questions like that. And it's not just based on race. I've had listings like this. People called up on one of my listings. And they would say, uh, well, who lives there? Well, the, the house is gonna be delivered vacant. No, 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 who lives in the area? What should my response be? What would you say? People. <laughs> well, yeah, I know there are people, but what kind of people are in that area? Is it mostly, is it mostly, uh, is it mostly whites or blacks or Hispanics? Are they mostly families or singles in the area in that community? I'd say just go check yourself, go around. I don't know. All right. Well, you, you sound like you keep telling me to go do stuff. How about, how about you do it this way? How about you say, how about this? Uh, if you're interested, are you interested in the property? Because uh, 
I, I could set up an appointment and I could show it to you. And then you, you could come down, walk the neighborhood, talk to the neighbors and see if it's a place that meets your criteria. But I really cannot talk to you about who lives in an area. It's actually against the law for me to do that. And I could lose my license and get fined usually for that. They could be deemed discriminatory. So I hope you understand. That's right. So, yeah. Isn't that an easier way? Uh, to, you guys are going to have to find a way to say it so it flows better. Because what they say here in the book, it sounds very robotic, don't it? Um, and you and we do get inquiries like that a lot, you know. And it's not necessarily that the people are trying to discriminate. Listen, I, I got another call from that uh, uh, for this for the same property from someone else. I got plenty of calls asking the same thing, and I had this one lady call up, and she was like. She said the same thing. She said, who lives, who lives there in the area? And I'm like, ma'am, because I got tons of calls on this property. People kept asking that, that same type of question. I'm like, ma'am, I can't talk about who lives in the area. It could be discrim uh, deemed discriminatory, you know. Blah, blah. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. You got me all wrong. Me and my husband, we're from New York. <laughs> we want a more diverse area. So who lives there? I'm like, ma'am, you're not getting it. Uh, it doesn't matter your reasoning. I cannot discuss that. You're telling me that your intentions are, are not for uh, discriminatory reasons, but because you want a more diverse area, but the law says that I can't talk to you about it, period. All right, so it, we do get inquiries like that. And sometimes you get somebody that twists it like that. Well, oh no, 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 you got me all wrong. I'm looking for a more diverse area. Oh, okay, that sounds good because it sounds like you you really are accepting it all kinds of- I told you that word background. is used a lot. Yeah. I told you that word is used a lot, diverse. Yeah, yeah, they, they may lie. They may want to discriminate, but they're lying about it, you know, to get the answer out of you, you know? Listen, we can't talk about it, period. So you guys are going to have to try to find a way to-, to get off that topic and tell people, come down, I'll set up an appointment, I'll show you, you could talk to the neighbors, you could uh, uh, meet the neighbors and uh, see if it's a place that you, uh, that you like, right? There's no reason for us to talk about who lives in a neighborhood, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've done it before. I, I've done it when I was trying to feel out how do we answer questions like that. I've done it before and I said, people, and then they're like, well, what kind of people? I'm like, what do you mean? I'm sure they're very nice people. <laughs> you know? but, now you, but now you sound like you're coming off kind of like a jerk, you know? So you, um, and unhelpful. So, but, but I mean, when you're getting started and you're learning how to answer these questions, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult area, difficult topic to discuss with people. Uh, okay. these, these sensitive social issues and things like that, you know? Uh, so, I mean, I learned just to relax and, um, and just, just talk, you know, if you don't have any discrimination or discriminatory thing in your heart anyway, uh, you know, I just talk, I just keep it real. I just tell people, listen, I can't talk about that stuff. I could lose my license. It's a, it's a, it could be discrim it could be deemed discriminatory. You know, I'm sure they're very nice people that live in the neighborhood, but you know, you could come down, you could meet them and blah, 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 you know. Just, just relax, talk you to them like they're people, you know, and, and, but tell them, be straight up with them. Say, listen, I could lose my license for talking to you about that stuff. It could be deemed discriminatory. So I'm sorry if I sound like I'm being around the bush, but no agent's going to tell you that. Do you have classes how to talk to people? <laughs> uh, I could, uh, in coaching <laughs> sessions and stuff that I've done. For my recording? Work. Um, yeah, I know, I know. Well, you know what, there's professional speakers out there. I, I'm going to, uh, until I make my own um, uh, videos and training like that, uh, in the meantime, right now, you could, you could find out videos like this from professionals, uh, real estate trainers and speakers like... Um, uh, David Knox, K-N-O-X, David Knox. Um, he's an excellent trainer and he teaches with humor. I like that about him. He's got a whole series of DVDs to training sessions, you know? Um, and uh, he also has uh, like these um, Monday uh, meeting uh, 
Zoom sessions like this that he does for training people can sign up for. But you could also just look them up on YouTube and find some people ripped some of his DVDs and they posted them up online and you can watch some of his training. He's got some really good training videos. I spent a couple thousand dollars buying all of his training videos. Uh, and uh, it's um, he's got training videos on topics from how to speak to people, how to overcome objections, how to negotiate with people, um, how to deal with for sale by owners, how to deal with uh, expired listings, how to do, you know, it goes over how to approach people to get listings this way, which by the way, I just gave you two ways to get listings. Approach for sale by owners, because you know they want to sell, they're just being cheap about it. And, and don't get nasty with them though. Uh, don't call them cheap either. Okay. Um, say, I realize that you're wanting to save your money and you don't want to pay the commission right now. So you want to try to sell the property on your own. But, um, you know, the statistics pan out that it's less than 5% of the people who actually try to sell for sale by owner are successful in doing so. So um, if at any point in the future, you decide you want to employ a real estate agent to help you to assist you in the sale of your home, here's my business card. I'd be glad to assist you if you would, uh, if you would take me into consideration. Uh, uh, I'd be appreciative of that. OK, and and you and then hopefully they'll come at you. You know, you get some agents that will go there, try to get the listing right then and there. If they don't get it, they're like, oh, you cheap bastard. <sighs> I mean, how rude you think the guy's going to call you now? You know, no. <laughs> I, I, I see agents, they talk like that to people. You know, it's yeah, it's, I was say, yeah. When you're broker, not that he has to, but when they advise you how to talk to clients you mean train you no not necessarily train you but maybe i'd guide you to how to talk to them better or how to actually talk to a client i know some brokers that don't know how to i can believe it okay <laughs> look here here let me give you a tip get a mirror and put it on your desk Anytime you're getting on a phone call, that's a business call. I suggest you do this. Before you pick up that phone, look in the mirror, straighten up your posture and sit up. Your voice changes. If you notice this, practice this at home. Sit in your normal posture. You're a little bit slouched over or whatever. And then sit up and like this. My voice just got louder and got clearer. It's just your body, uh, your body will make a louder, clearer voice when, you're, when your posture is right, you know? Okay. And then do this other thing. <laughs> smile. Smile. If you smile and you're looking at yourself in the mirror and you smile at yourself before you get on the phone, you're going to be in a better mood. Your voice is actually going to seem a little more approachable. These are subconscious things. Uh, I've learned some of these things from the... Um, uh, from Floyd Wickman. He's another real estate trainer, uh, David Knox. And there was this one, um, the Carnegie School of Sales I went to for training sessions. That was an expensive session. Thank God I didn't pay for it. A mortgage company did, but I went to it. What the hell? All expenses paid. Why not? So uh, I took the training class and I learned some stuff in there. They gave a, they gave a neat little tip, mimicking. You got to be careful about that though, because you could- Rolling guys. You could, well, <laughs> well, mimicking is actually a, a good negotiation and sales tactic um, when communicating with people. Here, let me, let me show you just a, a little example of this. Um, you know, people who talk loud, it sounds like they're always shouting in your face. Yeah. And you know, you know, some people, they're very timid and they're quiet when they talk in their nature and they slow. And then you get people who are talking really fast all the time. You know, they don't like getting the message because their brain is like on, on overdrive and they talk in over speed all the time like this. <laughs> talk, to, talk to fast talkers, faster. Talk to slow talkers, slower. Talk to loud talkers, louder. You know, you mimic them in that way. And they don't even realize that you're doing this on purpose. You're mimicking them. They'll actually feel more comfortable and more trusting of you because you're like them. And they're not even realizing. It's all a psychological thing. 
there's another tip to it, but I'm going to say proceed with caution on this one. If the person has an accent, mimic their accent, but you better do it good. You better do it slight. Don't go over the board doing that because then it seems like, are you mocking me? Mocking me. <laughs> That's right. You know? <laughs> well, you know, I've had, I've done this before and I could tell, I got caught before. I got caught before by somebody and I was, and I ended up saying, oh, no, no, no. I just, I, I kind of like your accent. So I was trying to, you know, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to offend you or anything. I was, I kind of like your accent. I was trying to you know, duplicate it, you know? Um, uh, and, you know, I got out of it and it was friendly, you know, but you got to be careful because it could be offensive to some people. If, if people you're out of sensitive. control. Are sensitive now, yeah, exactly. Exactly. So um, I've done it for people with Southern accents and slang with the New Yorkers, you know, um, hey, I've hey, done it hey. for people with Indian hey, accents, hey. With, <laughs> with like Western Texan accents, you know, I, you know, I, I, I've played it a little bit, you know, and it actually does work. It actually does work. You just got to be careful. Yeah, I'm telling you. Can't be funny about New Yorkers, be careful baby. with that one. All right? Yeah, you Can't don't want to be funny with the New Yorkers. Yeah, the New Yorkers, you know, they're, they're, that's, they're that's, that's what we You just got to be a little more aggressive with them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's finish out this chapter here. We got a half hour left, so we're almost done. So, um. Code for equal opportunity, that's all talking uh, in here somewhere on the next page, I think, um, or we passed it already. Uh, there is a thing where the Realtors Association and HUD, uh, so HUD and NAR have these fair housing partnership programs where you could get involved in community revitalization programs and cleanup programs or helping people build homes and stuff like that for like Habitat for Humanity and all kinds of stuff like that. That's all this is talking about. Or classes that they have that, um, that teach people um, how to get involved in home ownership so that everybody uh, in different communities and e has an equal opportunity in home ownership and to try to uh, get that message out to the public. That's what these types of programs are. And remember on the realtor.org website, they also had some things like that pertaining to this. All right. Implications for brokers and salespeople. You have to display that equal housing opportunity poster. You have to promptly display a sign stating that discrimination is against company policy as well as state and federal laws. That's what's just going on here in this section under implication for brokers, or this is what brokers should be doing anyway. They should make proper responses when client expresses discriminatory, uh, discriminatory desires. And what would that proper response be? I ain't taking your listing, right? You gotta turn down a listing if they tell you they wanna discriminate. Now there's also something called reverse discrimination. Uh, go down to the very last paragraph under implications for brokers and salespeople. Um, we're going to highlight reverse discrimination regulations are intended to preserve racial balance in given areas. Yeah, but what is the second word there? Discrimination. It's still discrimination. It doesn't matter what your meaning is or what your intent is. It's still discrimination. Ra uh, uh, reverse discrimination is basically um, trying to correct past wrongs uh, by, well, they could, there's a lot of ways they could go about trying to do it. But in essence, you're going to end up discriminating against a white person because you're going to try to um, undo past wrongs that people did ages ago. Um, you know, I did nothing wrong to anybody. I never had a slave. I never had uh, oppressed anybody, you know, but um, you, you get some regulation, some, a lot of times you're seeing it in politics right now coming, re-emerging um, re again, where you got all these people now talking about um, putting in regulations and all kinds of uh, stuff uh, to try to uh, elevate minorities and uh, persons of color, et cetera, to, to integrate them into different communities. But let me ask you a question. People have a right to live wherever they want to live. We should not be pushing people somewhere where they don't want to be. They have the right to be whatever they want to be. All these laws I've been teaching you express what? Do not impose any kind of limitation on somebody. 
It's inclusion. Okay, uh, it's inclusion, not exclusion. Um, so these are the practices and the way that you need to go about doing your business. As long as you don't exclude anybody, you don't put limitations on anybody, they have the right to choose where it is that they want to live. We're not yeah. supposed to be steering anybody. You know, um, see, we're seeing this reemerging now. We, we had a lot of things that have been going on the last year or so. Uh, and uh, politicians just love to chime in to get involved on whatever will get them popular, you know. Um, and unfortunately, this could put us as real estate practitioners in a difficult position. As it is, all these federal laws and state laws keep teaching us we're not supposed to look at somebody's race, religion, color, sexual preference, gender identity, pop, 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 pop. And now they're trying to tell us, well, yeah, you need to because we need to get more of these people over here. Wait, that's steering. It's a violation of federal law, you know? Um, so what do we do if a local politician puts in some kind of local regulations that say that we have to get more of these people over there? I'm going to teach you to ignore them. I'm going to teach you that that's probably just a fad of that person. And I'm going to go by federal law. And I'm going to say people have the right to decide where they want to live. And I ain't steering nobody anywhere. Right? So just do the best you can of not chiming in on that conversation. Too many gray areas. Man. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, it's getting insane. It's, it really is. It's, it's all the political correctness too. You know, I am the least politically correct person in this world. You know, um, I don't know about this world, but you know, I, I think that that's just basic uh, political correctness to me is just the dumbing down of a nation, you know, to ignore facts, ignore things you know to be true, you know, um, and we need to uh, just use our common sense. But the problem with that is what? Common sense ain't so common. Uh, common sense ain't so common, right? Uh, so uh, I don't know how to teach that to you guys. <laughs> you know? So Can't be taught. I discussed some things to you guys earlier, testing and testers. Okay, those are undercover mystery shoppers. They're basically volunteers of HUD that test licensees acting like they're buyers and renters to ensure we're treating everybody equally the same and not engaging in discriminatory practices. That's the best definition I could come up with for it. If we're going to look at it in the book uh, under testers on bottom of page 77, let's highlight testers are checkers or undercover volunteers who want to see whether all customers and clients are being treated the same. Then turn the page. Where is that? Uh, that is on the bottom of page 77 under testing. You see the on the first line, the word testers in bold. I like that from that point to the end of the next line. All right, and then turn the page. All right, so we have a, we got a, a chart here on page 78 we're going to go over. Uh, just like I, I, I created one similar right here on the slide, so I'm just going to look at the one right here on the slide. Basically, the advertising rules, instead of reading all the advertising rules, I'm just going to explain them to you based on the chart. There's a category, the rule, what's permitted and what's not permitted in advertising. This is not talking about our personal conversations we have with people. This is talking about what we put in writing, television, tel uh, TV, radio, uh, print advertisements, online, social media. What are the rules for advertising? Well, when the category is race, color, or national origin, the basic rule is no discriminatory preference or limitation can be expressed and that's the same rule for pretty much all of these going down the chart. No discriminatory preference or limitation. We include everybody, right? What is permitted? Master bedroom or good neighborhood are terms you're allowed to use in your ads. You're not allowed to use terms like white neighborhood or no French, okay? Uh, plus, 
I don't like using negative or derogatory terms in ads anyway. Your ads should always be positive. Even if you're trying to help people out. I, I, I'll show you what I'm talking about when we get down to disability. Now, religion. Once again, no discriminatory preference or limitation can be expressed. You are allowed to state that there's a chapel on the premises or kosher meals are available, or you're allowed to say Merry Christmas in your advertisements. Okay, well, how is that? Why is that allowed? Why are you allowed to say chapel on premises or kosher meals available? Well, you're, you're talking about a service on the premises. You're not talking about stuff that's in the neighborhood. If you're talking about things are in the neighborhood, oh, there's like a lot of Jewish stores in the neighborhood and kosher meals are available in the neighborhood. That's a dog whistle that, hey, there's a lot of Jews in the community, okay? Um, so you, uh, why you're allowed to say chapel on premises or kosher meals available because let's say you're selling a condo unit that's in a building that has a kitchen and they have kosher meals available in that kitchen. You're just describing a feature that's on the premises. You're not describing off-site features, okay? Or if there's a chapel in that premises. Now, ads, you could say Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Festivus for the rest of us, you know, um, Happy Kwanzaa, whatever it is, you're allowed to say it, right? Um, I don't know, everybody got so hypersensitive with this political correctness that it, to the point that everybody's getting stupid. You know, at what, at what point did it become that I can't say Merry Christmas to a Jewish person and that's being offensive to them? Like I've had Jews tell me, uh, you know, um, you know, Happy Hanukkah, you know, well, Merry Christmas to you too. You know, I mean, uh, it's, I don't take it as an offensive statement because I'm not Jewish, right? Um, and I don't know why everybody becomes so hypersensitive. So we are allowed to say these things in ads. The reason why I'm discussing this stuff is because, because of our hypersensitivity today and the dumbing down of common sense, we now are like, what can you and can't you say? What's acceptable? So now we're getting confused, <laughs> right? Yeah. So... You're not allowed to say things in ads like, well, first of all, no is negative. So don't, don't put that in an ad. You're not allowed to say things like no Muslims or nice Christian family or walking distance to synagogue. Ooh, wait, how come you're not allowed to say walking distance to synagogue? Is that all the premises? Synagogue is very particular to a one specific religion. Mm. Jewish, right? Yeah, that's like, or saying within walking distance to a mosque. What's that? What's that? That's like a dog whistle that Muslims are in the area or, or yeah. synagogue, Jews are in the area or uh, the church is around the corner. That that means, oh, it's more of a Christian Catholic area, you know? Um, so you cannot put these terms in ads. What you could say is something more secular. Not So it's not targeting one religion. You could say, within walking distance to houses of worship. And then if that is important to somebody of a particular religion, they're gonna call you up and they're gonna ask you, well, what kind of house of worship is it within walking distance of? And then over the phone, I could be like, oh, well, there's a, there's a church around the corner over here, or there's a synagogue over there, or there's a mosque over there. You know, I, I could, then I could have that conversation, but in the ads, we don't wanna put that stuff because it could seem like we're targeting somebody. Or, or we're trying to put a dog whistle up. Oh, these people are in the area. Look out, you know? Okay, now when it comes to sex, no discriminatory preference or limitation can be expressed. You are allowed to use terms like in-law suite or mother-daughter or female roommate sought. Anybody know what an in-law suite is, by the way, or mother-daughter? It's the same thing. That's it's like another little level with a kitchen, like a, a room. Okay. Two entrances. It is, a, it is a single family house. It is zoned as a single family house, but it's set up like two apartments. So it may have a separate entrance, its own kitchen, its own bathroom, its own area. 
these are great and these are in demand for people who maybe um, you uh, you get an example like one of my clients they just got married you know a couple just got married and one of them has a an aging parent they still get around but they want to keep a close eye on them because they're kind of older so they want them to live close to them but they don't want them all up in their business you know what I'm saying and they and then this way that parent can also have their their um their freedom to come and go as they like so they have a house and then their parent has their own apartment there that's close close by in the same building they could check on them but they have their own freedoms and come and go as they wish without intruding on them uh, and now the uh so it's often referred to as an in-law suite or a mother daughter okay now female roommates sought why is that allowed How is that not discriminatory? Because women yeah. are neat. They're not threatening, I guess. Uh, well, we're talking about somebody who's going to live in the same unit as you. Their roommate. You may get a female that could put an ad out there that says that she's looking for a female roommate. She doesn't feel comfortable with some old guy creeper coming all up in there, live, wanting to live with you. Oh, yeah, I want to live with you. You're here. You're, you, you know, uh, you know, they're not going to want that. Oh, what happened here? Oop. There we go. So, um, you're not allowed to say things like great house for a man. Why not for a woman or any of those thousand other genders they're making up these days? Uh, <laughs> or wife's dream kitchen. Wait, does that mean you, you need to be married? Right. Um, is that only for couples? It sounds a little discriminatory there, maybe. Or using terms like man cave in your ads. Once again, this is not talking about conversations you have with people. I use these terms all the time with people, man cave. You know, um, it's okay. It's not discriminatory. But if yeah. you put it in a written ad, man cave. You're going to get some women that are, get offended by that or people who are just sensitive. I don't know. Um, you know what a man cave is? It's usually like uh, you got the um, you got a basement maybe that's set up for like a theater for the man. Or he's got, got his pool table down there and a bar and that's his hangout. That's where him and his boys go and they hang out. You know, that's a man cave. OK. Um, and like and likewise, women have their she sheds. <laughs> you, you guys, you guys seen this one before, right? There. Well, it finally happened, Zachary. Somebody burned down my she shed. Nobody burned down the she shed, Cheryl. Well, my she shed's on fire. My she shed was struck by lightning. Zachary, is my she shed covered by State Farm? Yeah, you know. Yeah, that picture. I'm getting a new she shed. Hey, she shed. That's a pretty nice she shed right there. She got a chandelier in there, electricity going on. What, what is a she shed? This is one of those HGTV things. They said, hey, the man has his cave. He's got the man cave. Why shouldn't the woman have her own little area where she could have her escape and time where she could do whatever her hobbies are and meet with her girls, you know? And they do. So they get these sheds and they, 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 they you'll take a, a shed and instead of storing tools in it, you make it all into like your own private little room and, uh, all decked out like that you know that's a impressive one that she got there that's burning down though um okay disabilities disabilities no discriminatory preference or limitation can be expressed um you are allowed to say in your ads wheelchair ramp walk to shops walk in closet without being discriminatory against somebody who cannot walk you know jogging path you're just describing features that are there walking distance to shops or whatever you're not discriminating against people because they can't walk you know see people get a little sensitive about what can i say is that discriminatory against the people who are handicapped you know come on guys use common sense you know just don't use statements like no wheelchairs or able body tenants only now Sometimes you may be trying to do this, able-bodied tenants only, that one just seems whacked out. Now, no wheelchairs or not handicap accessible, 
I could understand the reasoning behind you wanting to say that, but don't. Um, it's negative. And look, you can have home buyers that you're turning away, even though you're just trying to like save them a trip because maybe they there's no uh, place, there's no wheelchair access, there's no it's not handicap accessible to people. Yeah. If you put that negative stuff in an ad, the handicapped person will never call. I like to keep ads positive. If somebody's handicapped, they're going to call me. I want them to call me because this place isn't good for you because it's not handicap accessible, but I may be able to do some research for you and find you one that is. Okay. I'm, I'm not chasing away clients. I don't want to chase away clients. That's like putting the sold sign rider on a sign or an under contract sign rider on a sign once you get an offer and it goes to attorney review. I'm not going to do that. I don't want any sign writer. I want people still to call me and I, I'm going to get their information, talk to them, see what they're looking for. And um, then I'll tell them that this property is no longer available. It's under contract, but perhaps I could help you find something else. Right. Um, now, when it comes to familial status, no preference on family size or limitation. You're allowed to say two bedroom, family room, quiet neighborhood, even though that has nothing to do with a family, at least not mine. <laughs> you know, we're noisy. Families are noisy. Um, and uh, you're not allowed to say things like married couples only or no more than two children or retirees dream home or no young children, even if it's a 55 plus community. You know, you don't want to go putting negative stuff in the ad. You could just say senior housing or 55 plus community. Right. Well, it finally and oh, let's look at a little discrimination case, and then after this, I think we're done, and then we'll do the key terms to review, and then we'll be done. Okay, so this is going to take a couple minutes to watch. Let's watch this. I found this news clip. Uh, I think this was in South Carolina somewhere. Um, basically, you have a reporter here that was looking to buy a condo or rent a condo in this building, and. Um, uh, I, I believe that they were a, a, a mixed couple and the guy felt like that they were discriminated against when they were shopping for a house. So they ended up, uh, uh, and he worked for the news agency. So they ended up getting one of their friends who do investigatory reporting and they did a little sting operation on this agent. So this case covers a lot of stuff, everything from getting caught, showing people discriminating, HUD getting involved in investigating, and then who gets fined and who could be held responsible for this, all in one little story. So I like showing this one. So pay attention here. Uh, high rise in Columbia, no African-Americans living there. Is there a reason? Good evening and thanks for being with us. I'm JR. And I'm Darcy Strickland. The reason could lie with one real estate agent. A News 19 investigation uncovered what appears to be active discrimination inside a prominent Columbia high rise. News 19's Johnny Chapel has been working on this story for months now, and he joins us with the details. A lot of us here have put a lot of work into this story, and we hope that uh, we can bring some possible good out of the JR and Darcy. Who has the right to tell you where you can live? In January, I started looking to buy a new home. The very first place I visited, a realtor told me that for 25 years, the building had remained exclusively white. Her comment sparked our investigation, and our investigation has the federal government looking to take action. Looking up from anywhere between five points in downtown, it's hard to miss. 1829 Senate Street, a 30-year-old high-rise, 19 stories of high-end housing. In all, 96 luxury condos. The heritage, all white on the outside, and there's a woman who may be trying to keep it all white on the inside. And Bryant is a longtime heritage resident. She's also a realtor, and she shows just about every property that comes up for sale in the building. After my experience, we sent a team to investigate. A News 19 employee and her sister told Bryant they wanted to see what was available. Ryan showed them two occupied condos before going inside a condo for sale on the 12th floor. 
At the time, the residence was not on the market. Bryant said she thought it would list for around $170,000. When I have a listing, you know, I mean, I may not need to put in, in the computer because it's just, it's just not going to be like that. And she said that all prospective clients and their realtors go through her. I meet people to show in the building. I mean, if it's another agent showing, I mean. Bryant went on to indicate that race determines whether she allows a person to see or inquire about purchasing property. And I'm very careful when I make this statement. We do not have a mixed neighborhood. And I think that is because we are, we try to be careful and to try to stop this She makes those differences appear black and white. Those statements mark the third time we had heard Bryant referring to possible discrimination. She said it to me during my visit and to another News 19 employee during a previous trip. We showed the tape to Dudley Gregory, who's with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. That conversation is enough to give me pause and that I would want to look further. Gregory said Bryant's behavior very likely violates a federal law. Under the Fair Housing Act, a realtor cannot discriminate in seven protected areas, including race. The issue is how many people have been to that place that are minorities that have been denied to even come through the door. Local realtor Shelby King says those licensed in her field must complete class time every two years to keep up to date on the Fair Housing Act. We are reminded about fair housing constantly. King cites standard clauses in buyers and sellers agreements that deal with the law. She says there are certain things a realtor cannot discuss when showing a property, and that sometimes she's had to steer yeah, clear of a client's questions. And they will usually preference the statement with, I'm not prejudiced, but uh, what's the mix of the neighborhood? Um, and I cannot address that. So why would Ann Bryant, who's required by her profession to adhere to a federal law, risk losing her license? She agreed to meet us at the Heritage for an interview. You said you show most of the properties here. Uh, to the best of your knowledge, have you ever discriminated based on a person's race as oh, to whether no, or not they can live here? can live at the Heritage. We have no discrimination of any kind in the building. She denied ever talking about race with potential buyers, even after I told her about our investigation. We've had several people come to us and say that, that you say that this is not a mixed community, that it's only white people are allowed oh, to live no, here. No, no, I've never made that statement to anyone. Uh, I would certainly lose my license if I did a thing like that. I do not have a mixed I've never made a statement like that. So here's what's happened as a result of our investigation. Today, Ann Bryant submitted this letter to her employer. She's retiring from real estate effective immediately. For my, her agents, <laughs> yeah, look at that. For this issue, her former employer is requiring each agent to sign a sec. Now you may be thinking, wait, she's going to get off like that. She's just going to resign and then later on just come okay. back again no 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 take a look in ethics policy also i've spoken with the president of the heritage homeowners association his comments we don't discriminate in any way at all on the issue of why bryant has been on hand almost every time a prospective buyer looks at a condo for sale in the building the president said, quote, she is not authorized by the board to show property. After viewing our tape, HUD opened its own investigation. HUD officials have told us their attorneys will be able to make a decision based on the possible violation of federal law very soon. And, of course, J.R. Nashik will keep you posted. Well, Check Johnny, this. have has this realtor had any past incidents? We found out today, yes, she has. Uh, in 1997, a couple filed a claim against Bryant's former employer, naming her and her realtor is accusing her of steering. That's a practice referred to right here in the Fair Housing Act. Protected class, what type of housing or location would or would not be appropriate for them, steering them in that direction. Her employer settled that claim 
and Bryant had to pay a fine for that offense. So certainly a lot coming out of the story still to come, and we're going to continue to follow it in the next couple of days. All right, John, thank you. Sure. Well, we also contacted the State Realtors Association after our investigation of the heritage, and this is how they responded to what we uncovered. Realtors adhere to a high standard of integrity and a code of ethics that requires equal access to fair and affordable housing for all, regardless of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, or national origin. They go on to say, as realtors, we deplore and will actively pursue action against any member whose actions run contrary to the federal or state fair housing laws or the Realtor Code of Ethics. Well, we would like to get your feedback on our investigation. Check this out. There's a follow-up on what actually happened in just opinion. one second. Here. You can call us at 647-0299, or you can log on to our website at WLTX.com and click on the viewer's da, 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 voice da, 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 section. Da, da, da. We'll share more on this investigation, including some of the comments we received tonight with you tomorrow during our 6 o'clock newscast. Check this out. Uh, I'll, I'll pause it so you guys can read this here. You know, in... Uh, 2015, HUD launched an investigation and reached a settlement with Century 21 uh, that realtors, uh, Bryant had to give up her real estate license and she died last year. So she's not gonna be working no more in the business, but check this out. HUD still continued their investigation. So this guy is a black public relations specialist for that uh, city in uh, South Carolina, who is her uh, uh, chapel's roommate at the time. Brian made her comments. He filed a housing discrimination complaint in federal court uh, last year that ended in a settlement against the broker. She's dead already. And they still pursued this. This is showing you how the broker can still be held liable for things their agents do. They had guilty knowledge. Remember guilty knowledge? Guilty knowledge doesn't necessarily even mean that the broker knew about it. It could be, should they have known about it? Gotcha. Especially with her past history. Okay. So they still got an award of $90,000 after the lady's dead now, you know? And that's that. All right. So that's the end of that slideshow, too. Uh, that's the end of chapter four. Uh, let's do the key terms to review, and then we're done here for the day. All right. Uh, okay. Key terms to review. There are, oh, there's one of them. All right. Federal law setting many protected classes with some exceptions to them. What federal law has some exceptions to it? Federal Fair Housing Act. There you go. You see the way that I ask it in a different way? If you ask yeah. yourself a question about the question, like I just did, I made the statement and then I asked you a question about the question and then boom, you got it. Yeah. That's how you should take exams. <laughs> <laughs> that's, seriously, that's how you should work on exams too. So five is A. Federal law protected classes of race and color without exception. Okay. Civil so Rights Act, 1866. Yep, three is B. Inducing panic selling based on prejudice. Lock busting. Lock busting. Lock busting, yeah. Two is C. New Jersey law governing discrimination in real estate transactions. Six. That's the lad, the New Jersey the law lad. against discrimination. Six is D. Laddie. Refusal to lend in certain areas, usually inner city. Redlining. 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 Very, very good. Nine is E. Section of the Federal Civil Rights Act that covers housing. Title eight. Title, Title eight. eight. Very good. Very good. Is F. <laughs> Thirteen is F. Um, a specific group that may not be discriminated against. Protect the class. Protect the class. Is They're a protected class, correct. Court cases covering, now they don't even say low income, they just say moderate. Court cases covering low income housing. Mount Laurel. Mount Mount Laurel. Seven is H, the Mount Laurel decisions. Um, channeling home seekers to or away from certain areas. Kidding. Hearing. 
Steering, we just watched something all about that. Uh, 11 is I. Undercover checker who monitors fair housing compliance. Tester. tester. They're a tester, 12 is J. All right, cross out the word benign. The word benign means there's nothing wrong with it. On, uh, next to um, K, cross out the word benign. Uh, discrimination intended to protect past wrongs. Reverse discrimination. Pen is K, reverse right. discrimination. All discrimination is wrong. So putting a word benign there is kind of ridiculous. Uh, federal agency enforcing civil rights compliance. Department of Housing and Urban, Urban Housing Urban. Or is L, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD. Mm -hmm. um, statement about discrimination everyone listing property must receive. General's memorandum. General's, General's, General's memorandum about the New Jersey laws against discrimination and the federal laws. And that is correct.